Mark Sargent. So I know we didn't tell you the name of the podcast. It's called the Four Dudes in a Box podcast. Yeah, but there's only three. Because one of yeah, them is missing, missing. But now it's you. The, you are the fourth. I'm dude. the fourth dude now. Mark Sargent yeah. is the fourth dude. What What happened to the fourth dude or the the normal guy? He's um, MIA, missing in action. Missing in action. We don't know. No worries. So, where do you want to where do you want to start from? What do you want to do? Well, we were introduced to you from the Behind the Curve Netflix documentary. Of course, I know sure. you get that probably a lot. Yeah, uh, uh, more than I'd like, but that's fine. <laughs> oh yeah, but uh, you know, we did our own research ourselves, and we were really interested, and we wanted to, you know, come on and talk to you about it and find out, sure. you know, what you have to say. So yeah. the first thing that comes up in the documentary is the idea of us being in a planetarium soundstage type thing. Right. And I wanted to ask you about that and like, like, how does that, how does that work? We just want to kind of educate people first and foremost. Okay. So short version. Uh, I didn't even ask you how long we wanted to go. How, as long how as long... you. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, let's let's go for a while. Um, the you're not living the the conventional model is you're living on this tiny little rock covered with a little bit of water and smoke, and you're flying through an impossibly huge universe at an amazing speed, and you feel nothing, and your life is an accident. You're part of the Big Bang, and nothing means anything. You might as well just jump off a bridge right now. <laughs> the flat Earth goes in a different direction. And it says, no, you are living in a building uh, with walls and a floor and a ceiling. And it is so big and so advanced that even our best and brightest didn't figure it out until almost 1960, that being the United States and the Soviet Union. And when they figured it out, they were like, yeah, we're not going to tell anybody. <laughs> it's, there's, there's no point even bringing this up because it's gonna, just going to wreck everything we created. Because in 1960, modern civilization pretty much been set with the exception of you know advanced computers and stuff like that. And so, yeah, that's that's the message we put out there. And you're not an accident. You are built, for, you know, this place was built for you and you're here for a reason. Do we know exactly what that reason is? No, I've got some theories on it. Uh, but it gives, you know, it's the only conspiracy that gives people hope. It's the only positive conspiracy. Every other conspiracy out there is kind of dark and sinister. And, you know, everyone talks like they're Christian Bale in a Batman movie. Yeah. But, but, but Flat Earth is really positive. You know, it, it's, um, there's a lot of women in Flat Earth, mostly because there's, there's not, it's not a negative thing. It gives people something to, something to shoot for. And so that's, it's not one of the reasons I do it. It just happened, just turned out that way. But I got I got involved back in 2014. You know, looked at it, thought it was stupid, ridiculous. Why would anyone ever look at it? Then nine months later, I'm banging my head on the keyboard, going, "Why can't I solve this?" And so I, you know, I made a series of videos called Flat Earth Clues, threw them out on the internet, said, "Internet hive not mind," which is very very intelligent, the hive mind, uh, as a collective, and then no one could come back with anything everybody just kept coming back was like yeah it's not that crazy you know everyone it was the opposite and then people from all branches of everything were contacting me you know all branches of the military and pilots and engineers and air traffic controllers and all these people were calling me saying yeah it's not nuts here's why and that was five years ago and change and here we are with the exception of 2020 we were just crushing it i mean last year i was i did speaking engagements i think in seven countries and we made the we, yeah we made the cover of Newsweek, Popular Science, and Skeptic all in the same year, and, and these are magazines that don't want to talk about this. Yeah. And and we made we made the cover, and it was great. So I, I even got to I even got to do fun things. Uh, I did a um uh, a commercial in Australia for some mobile company that that does mobile gambling, and they called me up and and said. Fly down to Melbourne and shoot a commercial for it. It's like, okay. And I was two seconds away. Just one more thing. I was two seconds away from, uh, I had just done the, a conference in London and I came back and a London group says, oh yeah, we have this thing over in the UK called Pancake Day and McDonald's wants you to come over and we're going to do a whole thing. And it's like, you know, because Flat Earth Pancake. Oh, wow. so, yeah. And it was like, oh, great. You're awesome. It'd be awesome. And uh, I was like, yeah, sorry, the borders are closed because of the virus. It's like, yeah, you guys suck. So 
There you go. That's my opening intro. Yeah, the the pancake thing, McDonald's. That's a huge. You know, that would have been so much fun. I I, mean, I I would have loved it. I mean, I, mean, I didn't hate the the Australia thing, um, but you know, the, I knew they were poking fun at us. But at the same time, there were flat earthers in the company that hired me, uh, yeah. because the the campaign was called Foolproof, and that is if you can use our app. You know, even even these guys can use our app like this flat earther. You know, yeah. it's like, hey, it's me. Yeah, it's like, and though they're just, you know, pay, they're still paying you money that will go. Oh, to yeah. Yeah. yeah you want to like, if anything, yeah, you want to you, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. You want to pay me to say flat earth on camera? I have no problem with that. I, I, I have told people it's like, look, you want to <clears> sit me down and throw pies at my head as long as I can do it, you know, say flat earth while I'm doing it. I am totally fine with that. And so even though the community was like, oh, you know, some people was like, oh, he's selling out. It's like, no, 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 no. Well, you know, I got to do this. And people, you know, the, the, the concept was still intact. Now, and in fact, they even asked me during one take if I would renounce it. You know, it's like a joke. It's like, no, I don't believe in Flat Earth anymore. It's like, no, I'm not going to say that. It's like, come on, give me a little integrity. Yeah, that's that's anyway. more of a sellout type of thing. I mean, really. that would be a sellout. Yes, if if all is like it's like it's a big joke. No, yeah. I wish I wish it was a joke most time most days, but it's not. Um, that's the thing that everyone gets into. I mean, everyone gets into it trying to disprove it. Nobody in the community thinks it's a great idea. Yeah. You know, going in, it's like this sucks. You know, it's, it's, it's terrible. I mean, conspiracy they just kind of wave you off like you're the you're the the black sheep of the family at a family gathering right you know it's like oh yeah don't talk to him you know flat earth ugh, him flat earth awful. Uh, yeah I've, I've i'm not kidding you where the first paragraph of my clues where i said that i've talked to people they're absolutely convinced that the royal family in the uk is made up of lizards right they're, they're lizard people absolutely convinced of this and i go yeah, what about that flat earth stuff though, right? They're going, get the hell out of here. It's like, what are you talking about? You just told me all these people are lizards. But flat earth's too crazy, right? Yeah. yeah. We are we are loathed in the in the uh, truth community. Uh, we're just absolutely loathed. I've had so many people um, that were like big 9-11 guys. They, they would be like, no, 9-11, that's the top of the top of the food chain. There's nothing bigger than 9-11. You're, you're just distracting from, from the true conspiracy. It's like, no, I'm not. I go, Flat Earth's bigger than 9 11. I don't want to hear it. Anyway, what else you got? Hey, Mark, I, got a, I got a quick question. I go back I don't to think uh, what? the intro. Um, so you said like the US and Soviet Union discovered the Flat Earth. Like, can you go in a little bit more depth with that? I think that's oh, yeah, pretty yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, the so, I'm curious about that. That was, that was interesting. I wanted to... So in. How I got into this was I was looking into, I wasn't even looking into Flat Earth, like a lot of it. I just found it by accident. Um, I was looking into the hollow Earth. I was fascinated with that. You know, there could be aliens living in subterranean caves and stuff lizard like that. Lizard people inside the Earth. Yeah, lizard people yeah. inside the Earth. Yeah, Judds and Morlocks and, and uh, probably some hobbits or at least golems. Um, they were down there. Uh, no, I was looking into the, the hollow Earth theory and it was right. I ran into a guy. Uh, real guy uh, admiral bird richard richard bird who was the youngest united states admiral in the history of the navy and he supposedly took this journey to the center of the earth thing he flew in a rickety plane in 1926 first got to go to the to the north pole and after he went up there you know supposedly he found this entrance and you know there's prehistoric civilization and and you know weird things that were in the middle of the north pole and you would have thought if that was true he would be going back to the north pole a lot more often but he didn't the the united states military sent him to antarctica and they and he flew pl he flew his own planes his own um, research planes and he they had him flying basically out there in bigger and bigger missions from 1928 all the way really up until his death in 1957 he spent 30 years down there and what's interesting is that what he would do is he would do these missions and then he'd do a, like a press tour you know it's like because you know, people were curious like, what about this antarctica you know because it's just boring it's snow and ice and so he'd go around and, and do tv interviews and he did this tv interview in 1954 on a show called the uh, long jeans chronoscope and look it up it's on youtube and i found it and it was it was it's in beautiful quality and they said um he said that, yeah, we're, he's going down for one more mission in uh, 1955 called Operation Deep Freeze. 
Well, that was the last mission he ever did down there because, after, and there were a whole bunch of nations down there with him, the biggest being the Soviet Union, the, the post-war, the World War II Soviet Union. Um, UK was down there too, and Chile and Argentina and Australia and New Zealand. And there was a whole bunch of countries down there doing research. And, but the, the USSR was, was definitely the, the biggest, because, you know, the big, you know, a lot of logistical stuff. Big. And they were looking for resources too. And he said on the show that the entire continent was basically made out of money because the, there was a huge mountain range made out of coal. There were minerals, there was oil and gas, there's uranium. And he was given way too, way too much uh, information on camera. And he was afraid actually there'd be conflicts down there that he goes, but well, yeah, we're going to all be down there for the next hundred years fighting over all the resources that are down there because nobody owned it which is another thing. Nobody, nobody to this day even owns Antarctica, which just blows me away. So he goes down for Operation Deep Freeze, and right after up for Operation Deep Freeze ends, they close Antarctica off for all time from any corporation ever. So what happened was, and, and they started putting in place, and I'll send you the PDF, you could find it online though, called the, the Antarctic Treaty of 1959 which basically says that all countries, no, what, no corporation from any country can set up shop there ever, forever. I mean, you know, there's, there's no, in fact, it isn't even up for review until 2041. And it was written a long time ago. I mean, it's like, what, and, and it goes against everything that we are as, uh, as, a, as a civilization. You know, everyone knows that, all, uh, that money and power and greed rule everything, right? If we want to start fracking in your backyard tomorrow, we can make that happen is not tough to do you know we just throw briefcases of money at people and it's like oh yeah put the oil rig right here where my above ground pool used to be and that but that didn't happen down there it was the exact opposite whatever was going on down there was bigger than money well how many conspiracies are bigger than money i can count them really all in one hand and one of the big ones is while well, there's something out there that no one should be looking at including oil and gas companies in fact not only are oil and gas companies not allowed to go down there they're not even allowed to talk about it that's the big one it's like okay no one's even protested the treaty you remember all treaties have been broken right oh, yeah. there there isn't there's only one treaty in the history of treaties and there's been a bunch that is that has never been broken and that has been um the antarctic treaty so that was a huge red flag for me which is like okay so something's happened whatever's down there it's like unless unless you convince me that you found 50 foot tall frost giants standing next to a ufo or perhaps you know a, a whole herd of unicorns but even that wouldn't stop people this is something where they don't want anyone down there now can you go into antarctica yes you can you can spend i imagine all you guys are in america right now yes yes yep. yeah okay fifteen thousand dollars that'll cost you 15 grand you can go down to antarctica you can wear your orange survival suit and freeze to death in a rubber raft and, and uh, walk on the snow and have a picture taken with penguins. But if you want to go inland just on your own, it's like, hey, can we get a helicopter and just go off? And no, no, you are not allowed to do any of that stuff. Yeah. And uh, it's even to this day. I mean, they just keep enhancing the treaty every so many years to keep people like um, three years ago, they banned drones from it. Mm. You know, you can't even you can't even fly a drone down there of any type. And it's like, why would you ban drones in Antarctica? It's like, well, they just don't want to take the chance. So, yeah, those are interesting. The whole idea of like, right here, we're going to cut it. It's like, th that's always like, uh, you know, where people get like questioning. They have, they're like, all right, well, why is this cut off? And there's always a reason, right. well, but it's but, weird but when they don't... don't explain the reason. It's like, it's yeah. like, usually it's kind of like, all right, you can't have this candy because it's too close to your bedtime. But it's right. like, you know, why can't I drink water at noon? You know what I mean? It's like... <laughs> Well, they don't. What the, there's two reasons why it works so well. One, the place is so hostile in terms of an environment that nobody wants to go there anyway. It is the least traveled place of all time. Um, but the other thing, and because of that, it's out of out of sight, out of mind. Nobody wants to go there. I mean, yeah, you, you see some older people. It's like it's on their bucket list. They went to every continent. It's like we should go to Antarctica, and then it's like you know, it's super cold, and they 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 hate every second of it. Mm -hmm. The other thing was though is that. When you hide it like that, they, they were really quiet about doing it. So they didn't, it's out of sight, out of mind, meaning the corporations, like let's say you're the head of Exxon Mobil, right? And you want to go down there. 
all it takes is one phone call, right? So the CEO and the board, they have to make the decision. It's usually one guy at the top or a couple guys. But all you know, these guys, all these companies are monitored. I guarantee it. All our emails are monitored anyway. Yeah. But I'll take one memo from one guy at Exxon and be like, yeah, I'm thinking about doing some Antarctica thing. And then you get a call from somebody at the DOD and they say, yeah, national security, you don't want to go down there ever and don't even think about it. Yeah. And so that and that works. People, they're not going to mess with that. You know, they're not going to. Like, are there like guards to it, Antarctica? Like, is that how it is? Are there like. There has been rumors of some sort of multinational defense force that's out there, but then again, that would have to be you, secret, right? Because then there's no. Yeah, you'd have to. You'd have to. The last thing you want to do, you know, like with anything, right? If you, the second you start posting signs saying, you know, or or a group of guys with special patches on their arms, or fighter planes that don't make any sense. Yeah. But most of the time, you, you, what they've done though is they've sealed everything off in layers of permits. Mm -hmm. So you, if you want to go out, you have to have permission from oh god like eight different nations like and that 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 takes time and the permit fees are apparently just outrageous and they're non-refundable it's like what's your motivation for even going out there plus even if you did you gotta remember the united states military was hunting around there for the better part of 30 years now your follow-up question may be well what did they find well for me it was only one thing which was the outer marker or at least the beginning of the outer marker so if the antarctic coastline is the beginning somewhere thousand two thousand miles inland somewhere out there is some sort of barrier eventually you're going to run into it now whether or not you can actually touch the barrier you know do they reinforce it with negative physics i don't know you know what's the barrier made out of whatever it is spooked them enough that they tried to blow holes through it for mm -hmm. four years straight um and they used of course the only thing they could you know men men are so predictable in that manner aren't they you know where it's like you see a wall that you've never seen before it's like Get the cannon, you know, and they're yeah. wheeling up the cannons. They're trying to blow through. It's where like, what else dynamite? you got? Where's the dynamite? And then yeah, where's the dynamite? Yeah, where's what's the biggest thing we got? That was, I think, out of the fifth element. You got anything bigger than the, the 240s? <laughs> um, we're, you know, atomic weapons. So the first three shots were all in the megaton range, you know, and this was when megaton was a big deal back in the, the late 50s. They were not easy to come by. And uh, after that, it was all kiloton you know, 100 kiloton, 200 kiloton, stuff like that, but still big, you know, way bigger than Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But if you can't bust it through with megatons, well, then you're just mapping the sky, uh, you know, for any aerospace stuff in the future, because you got to figure out what you're going to do there. And then maybe later you work on stuff. So it's like atomic weapons isn't working. What else you got? Well, we got harp. Maybe we can bust through it with some high frequency stuff, you know, modulate it. No, that's not working. You got anything else? <laughs> Look, how about CERN? We could stargate our way through it. Yeah. That's so ambitious. Is, Let's try that. What could go wrong? This wall, right? It, it, it's basically indestructible, you're saying? Yeah. And, and yeah. you can't we're, fly we're over not, it? We're not getting you through it. You can't fly over it? Or is it just... No, no, no. I, I mean, what I'm saying is it's it's it more it might as well be a dome, you know, I meaning you're, you're inside a, a giant building. And if the ceiling, whatever the ceiling's made out of, and honestly, that's dealer's choice, uh, heavy element, heavy water, um, uh, unified field, some sort of force field that we don't know about, unified field would probably do it. Whatever it is, the physics that we have access to can't punch through it. And honestly, they should have probably stopped at atomic weapons. I know they're getting tricky now. Brute force was the first option. Harp's actually not bad, and CERN, I mean, Every time I think of CERN, I think of um, Stephen King's movie, The Mist, <laughs> where, you know, you don't actually see the portal, but you know, once you open it, all these horrible things come yeah. through and, you know, zombie dinosaurs coming through, which is never a fun thing. So, again, science does stuff, not to go off on a separate thing, uh, science does stuff because they can, not because they should. In fact, it was, it, like, it was, the, it was the whole rationale behind the hydrogen bomb. So we had the atom bomb, which was perfectly fine. <laughs> nothing wrong with the atom bomb at all. Well, and more. they, they decided, it's like, hey, we could turn it into a hydrogen bomb. It's like <laughs> no one even questioned it. They're like, you think that's a, no, you, you think you have someone in the room. Like, you think it's a good idea. Um, the, the one example I love is when they were doing the first atomic test. You guys probably know this story. Out in the desert in the United States, one of the scientists was doing you know, some math and said, you know, there's a chance this thing just could ignite the whole atmosphere and burn the entire world to a crisp. 
and you know or make it just unlivable and and the answer came back it's like yeah but who's gonna yell at us if it happens <laughs> it's like, okay yeah. and they pulled the switch anyway you know even though it was a small percentage that it was going to happen there was a chance that it could happen so yeah science god love them yeah so what are your I, thoughts on extraterrestrials what what are your thoughts on extraterrestrials? I don't call them extraterrestrials. Do I believe there are spaceships flying around? If I could send, in fact, I could send you some wonderful video. The, the best sighting on video I ever saw was um, Oak Bay, Canada, from about 10, 12 years ago, which was just amazing because you could tell full well that uh, you can look it up if you want. Where, oh, okay, sorry. Let me answer your question first. Do I believe in, in things that are flying around the sky, unidentified flying objects? Yeah, I do. All day Pentagon long. Do I th video uh, what? Re recently, right? The Pentagon um, made official like a few videos of these these objects. Yeah, but just nah, that's nothing. Seriously, watch. I'll I'll send you a link. I've got the Oak Bay video somewhere on this machine, but you can look it up online. The two things though. Do do extra do the spaceship have anything to do with the Americans? No, it does not. The Americans love creating that illusion. Which is like, we'll take credit for all sorts of stuff. You know, we'll hint, we'll wink. We're like, oh, yeah, those spaceships, there, there are. Yeah. Broom Lake. Because that's how you scare other nations, right? You know, what, what you're really going to invade America with, you're going to invade a country that has an Area 51? Man, I wouldn't. <laughs> like, yeah. I would be really careful before I went anywhere near Nevada if I was an invading nation, or I would just nuke it till it glowed. Because. You don't want whatever's in there coming out. What but, do you think's in there? Oh, I think we've been reverse engineering stuff ever since the 40s. No question. Uh, ever since um, ever since Roswell. I well, think here, we've been... Here's, here's my question with this. Uh, I know that yeah. there's the whole soundstage like, uh, theory and belief, right? So yeah. if UFOs and like extraterrestrial aliens were to exist, would those be coming from the powers outside the dome pretty much? Like... Like pretty, like, yeah, it, that that's that's the big one of the big questions, isn't it? Is it it are there thing are the things that are flying around are they trapped in here with us, or do they have access to go outside of this place? Yeah, exactly. I, because I I always think I'm always thinking like I see people like big news outlets right like ABC is like oh yeah flat Earth like how we're gonna disprove it, and then they're right. showing it and it's just like a map of the flat Earth and then the ice and then the ground and then the sky and then the space. And it's like, right. well, I, then I see what you say, and it's like, all right, so soundstage type thing, and then there's somebody outside who's controlling this, and is that right. is that kind of the theory? Is it just like there's yeah, people yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but I don't think that the little players are necessarily controlling it. Um, there's so many pop culture references I could use, but the, the, the let, let me delve into that a little bit. The, the ships that are flying around, and you can find videos on this online. I've seen them myself. Uh, the stuff that people that don't look for, those are the ones, the things that are most glaring. The big one is that is people forget that spaceships that are flying around, uh, they work just like cars. Meaning cars work fine with the headlights off. You don't need the headlights on to run a car. In fact, we drive around all the time without headlights on, and you know, unless you have that auto stuff. Um, when you, I, when, uh, there was a British guy that recommended to me, you know, getting a pair of night vision binoculars and he goes, he goes, get a pair of night vision binoculars, not monoculars, but both eyes and look up in the sky and you'll see stuff. And I'm going, come on. So I bought a pair of, um, night owl, um, on Amazon, you know, in five X, you know, cause you can't get them very, very powerful, which is a whole nother thing. Mm -hmm. And I started looking up in the sky and the sky is freaking crawling with stuff yeah. most of which you cannot see because they don't have their lights on they're they're flying without the light you cannot see them with the with the naked eye and you say well they're satellites right and that's why i initially thought the first night i was out there it's like wow this I, I had no idea there were that many satellites and then all of a sudden i was watching one because they fly about the same the you know same height to where they're about the size of a star right you know in fact it, steven spielberg kind of joked in one of his movies where the the, the the spaceships all formed into the big dipper and froze and then the whole big dipper moved it was kind of like a running joke mm -hmm. so i'm watching this this one and it slows down like it's lost and then it makes you know like they're looking for directions and then makes a hard left turn and then punches it and and goes ballistic and it goes out of sight and it's like 
what the hell did I just watch? And that point I didn't trust anything. And I'm just, you know, if you follow a satellite, you know, what you think are satellites long enough, you'll see it. It's amazing. I had a similar experience to that when I was a kid. Not like no one really believes me, but I keep it to myself. It was like this little star and all of a sudden went crazy. It was like went to hyperspace. Like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's like, that's them. Myself, and it is not us. We have nothing to do with that. It is not the Americans in the slightest. In fact, the Americans, it's one of those things where the Air Force, they don't like talking about it because it, it completely it hurts their credibility. Meaning you can't say you rule the skies if you don't rule the skies. You know, you can't say that, oh, yeah, by the way, there's some things up there. Just blow our fighters, you know, to, away. Oh, they, yeah. we, can't even, we can't even touch these things. Um, there was a great line, though. That being said, though, there's stuff being worked on in Groom Lake, which is fantastic. I mean, you know, they built the entire SR-71 Blackbird system. And it went from uh, inception to retirement and nobody even saw it. And then they showed off at the end. It's like, oh, yeah, by the way, we're retiring this plane. It's like, what plane? And it's like, oh, yeah, this is our spy plane. And the best line was they were asking the Air Force General. They said, uh, they said, oh, yeah, what are you replacing it with? And he's like, ah, nothing. It's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> Liars. Of course you replace But again, that's the whole nature of spy stuff. Like, we didn't have a U-2 spy plane until one was shot down over the Soviet Union. It didn't exist. And then we had to admit that it existed. We still use it to this, to this day. Oh, anyway, so sorry to to the aliens thing. Um, do I think they're trapped in here with us? Yeah, I kind of tend to think that whatever's flying in here is trapped in here with us because I think they're just. Do I do I think they're from Mars and Jupiter and Venus? No, uh, because the, those are just lights, pretty lights in the sky. But do I think they're real? And do I think they're previous civilizations? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we've had shows and things. I mean, even Ancient Aliens, as much as there's some disinfo on there. Ancient aliens still tapped into some some real stuff, and that is there's evidence of previous civilizations all over the place. Sunken cities off of uh, Japan, sunken cities off of India, um, the Bosnian pyramids, the real pyramids, Bimini Road, Puma Punku. I mean, there's all sorts of places out there where you can tell there was advanced tech. I think that every civilization has their day. I think they, they have their run. We've gone 5,000 years, roughly, unbroken history. But I think we've tapped out more or less as far as what we can do mm -hmm. so that's kind of where we are i i don't think that everything is happening over the last year or two as an, as an accident and i also don't think that that flat earth being released um you're being helped by the mainstream media and people say oh you know you did all this like we didn't do anything we did all, some of their legwork for them we made the videos but they were the ones that promoted it i think flat earth is being promoted as part of a, a bigger thing you know, yeah. kind of to open m minds up. So if you had a spaceship, sorry, two more things. If you had a spaceship land tomorrow somewhere, people would be way more accepting of it now, even in the last few years. Uh, mostly because, uh, though, because we've now, ha everyone's got an alien reference. I don't care if you're eight years old or you're 80, you've seen enough sci-fi over the years. We've got, everyone's got their favorite alien movie. And everyone's got their idea of what it's what's going to look like. If you ever want to look up some interesting stuff, because you you know people say, oh, the greatest UFO sighting whatever was was Roswell, which wasn't even really a sighting; it was more of a military screw up some trucks where they shouldn't have reported. Went out, and then they were like, oh, "There's aliens." There's like, like some. People well, did you ever watch? If if you, did you ever watch the t made for TV movie Roswell from back in the in the eighties? No, but I I was like. I was going to talk about that when you brought up ancient aliens, because when I was like, when I was like eight, I hit a point where I was like, all right, I, I went to like the smallest part of the library and I'd pull out all the books on like aliens and like Sasquatch and I was obsessed with that. Sure. So for years since then, I've always looked at like, you know, aliens, da, 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 da. And Roswell was always like the scary thing. Like it was like, oh yeah, this is where they found it. It's like, check yeah. this out. But it's, There's... It's, it's crazy to see like how much comes out that's bigger than it, but they just don't talk about it. So it's like- No, well, remember, America wants to take credit yeah, if they can't. They, America wants, oh, you know, there's the, well, I'll give you two earlier stories. Both were in Germany. Um, one, of course, was the, again, I believe it, that, that, a, that a ship, another ship crashed in Force. some very, in, yeah, yeah, in, in Germany. And it's, it's sunk into soft earth, so it didn't break up, you know, like when it hit the, the desert in New Mexico and just start shattering a million pieces. It just, you know, just hit, you know, just duh. 
and it was mostly intact and they reverse engineered as best they could and that's where the the nazi war machine you know because they were leaps and bounds i mean come on nobody wants to talk about that they were launching jet fighters in 1943 exactly. at the end of that war um but the other the biggest sighting ever in the history and again look it up it's on wiki they can't believe nobody talks about it i mean ancient aliens mentioned it briefly but they they shied away from the rest of the story which was um nuremberg germany in 1561 where you know beautiful spring day i think it was april 4th where you know cl not a cloud in the sky and two giant armadas decided to just duke it out over the city just fighters launching the whole thing you know they didn't have sci-fi references they thought it was a religious event they were just beating the hell out of each other for a solid hour and when um uh, and long enough to where you remember, you know, these people are having breakfast. An hour is a long time, right? You know, they're they're having their toast and schnitzengluben, and you know, they're breaking. They had no cameras back then, so they they break uh, the sketch artists and they drew the whole freaking thing. Yeah. You know, they had time. You know, they colored it in. It's like, oh yeah, they're still there. So what was cool was so after that hour of these two groups just hammering on each other, a third faction shows up. And that's the part that ancient aliens left out. And I knew why. And that is because a giant angular black craft pulls in between the two of them. These two guys freak out and they take off. That thing hangs around for a little while and then takes off on his own. Hmm. Well, the reason why ancient aliens doesn't, doesn't mention it is because it gives it way more credibility and talks and really goes into the whole hierarchy. Which is like, okay, first off, who are these two guys? Why were they fighting? Why were they fighting over a city? Um, and then the third the, the third group, it's like, okay, who were they? The cops? The UN? What the hell? You know, why were these two guys scared at them? Why did these two guys jump in and tag team these guys? Well, obviously, there's rules to the game. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the third question, which I love so much, is like, what sort of response time is an hour, right? <laughs> I fire a gun off outside this window. There's going to be cops here in six minutes. It's no question. An hour? Come on, you could you could deploy you know people from from aircraft carriers and and have things here in an hour. Yeah. So interesting. Fifteen sixty one. Look it up. the The newspaper drawing is just gorgeous, and you're looking at it. It's it's just an amazing thing. Yeah, uh, I wanted to get into you know talking about this about sources and how we determine credibility, because sure. I know in our class we have a class called Theory of Knowledge, right? because we're in an IB program, International Baccalaureate, and we have theory of knowledge class. And the point of watching the Flat Earth documentary was to talk about how different people come up with different, like, trustworthy sources and how they determine knowledge to be credible or not. So yeah. when you go through things and you find things like the 1561, like battle, and, you know, yeah. we talk about the Germany stuff, what makes these credible to you? What... Like, how do you determine the difference? Okay, there's there's two things to look at there. One is general conspiracy credibility, and then two are fringe things which you just have gut feelings for. For me, when it comes to any conspiracy, if it, when I look at any conspiracy, if I if I'm going to say, oh yeah, that seems plausible, that doesn't, I you have to kind of put yourself in the shoes of whoever's on the other side of the chessboard. So I'm, I'm, which is why people accuse me of being a government agent for, for five years now, um, which is I, you know, whoever's doing it, whoever's committing the conspiracy, forget about what the conspiracy is itself, who's doing it and why. It's a line from JFK, you know, who benefits, who has the power to cover it up. Yeah. And when I look at it, I look at it from, the only words to describe it are the greater good. So does it benefit the greater good? So Meaning like there's a morality to there's a greater morality to the reason. Yeah, to yeah, when you get into the whole ethics thing, which is look, the, everyone likes to think nobody likes people controlling things above them without their permission or, you know, doing things. The you know they whisper about the government's like, you know, the government's all wearing black hats and twirling handlebar mustaches and, you know, <laughs> you know, that whole thing. And they're not. Most of the time, it's just empire building. Um, I, I can tell you from personal experience, even at a, a micro level, people make decisions for on other people's behalf because they think it's for their own good. And sometimes that can get you into trouble, but other times it's just the quickest way to do it. So 
when I hear the government, you know, the government making decisions, and we can talk about various conspiracies, um, every, just about every major American war, for example, there's decisions the public isn't allowed to make because it would take too long and it would be, the debates would, would, would never end and there's nothing would, would, would get done. Yeah. So eventually you have people in a room saying, okay, we're going to do this. It should be fine. You, the old saying, uh, what they don't know won't hurt them <laughs> type thing. Yeah, that's the big point though. They can't really find out. You know, you can't tell people the real motivations. In fact, sometimes you have to make up fake motivations just to get it done because the real motivations people aren't going to go for. Um, look at, look at, um, uh, and, and by the way, I, again, I'm not trying to be a horrible person when I say this. You absolutely can put a, a price on human life. You just can't put a price on human life of people you know. No one's going to sell out their, sell their mother. You know, no one's going to have their, their father killed. You know, not, I don't know what your guys' situation is. But the, it, it, you, you're not going to do that on your own. You can't make that decision, right? You know, uh, would, you, would you sacrifice a person uh, to save a thousand, right? Uh, okay, train, would you save, train yeah, would you save your own kid to save a thousand? Then it becomes the impossible decision, which you can't make it, so the government will make it for you. Uh, great examples of it would be, oh, I don't know. The Mexican-American War. How about that? Uh, we sacrificed the Alamo. 200 guys. Let them die. Right? But think of what we got out of that. So the whole thing was because Texas wanted to become its own country. And the government's like, nah, you don't get to become the country. We'll give you a state, though. But in, w during that negotiations, the Alamo with 200 guys gets surrounded by the Mex Mexican army. Did we intervene and you know, reinforce that and turn it into a long, drawn-out thing? No, we let the Alamo fall. It just got wiped out, including um, Davy Crockett was there. Real guy, by the way, not just a Disney guy. Uh, and uh, Jim Bowie from Bowie Knives. He was, he was there too. He got wiped out. And so with that rallying cry, remember the Alamo, think about that. What did we get out of that? Oh, let's see. We got Texas, New Mexico, because there used to be an old Mexico, Arizona, um, and that worthless pl place of, uh, worthless piece of real estate called California. Right, we got trillions of dollars worth of real estate, trillions in adjusted dollars for 200 guys. Best decision, best one of the best business things we've ever done. Um, Spanish American War, we let we blew up one of our own battleships. You can look it up, the main. It blew up for no reason. We blamed Spain because Spain was a weakening empire, and we launched war against Spain. Didn't even tell them. <laughs> we just went into the islands and started taking property. We got for this for that battleship. We got um, the Philippines, Guam, Puerto Rico, and we probably could have taken Cuba if we spent a little more time on it. And then, then that slipped later. And uh, fantastic decision. We those decisions get made like that. Um, Vietnam, uh, the Gulf War, perfect example. Not to get into the nine eleven thing too much, but come on, women are no. You have to go into the psychology of it, which is. Mothers do not like sending their sons to fight for things, resources. You know, mothers are like, why, you know, if it's a resource, I don't care what it is, timber, diamonds, oil, they don't like that idea. Fighting for revenge is one of the oldest, most common human motivators ever. And the, the easiest way to do that is you guys have probably done it in a schoolyard when you were young. And that is you walk up to somebody who's got your back, his back to you, you smack him in the back of the head. And when he turns around, you point at your friend. It's the easiest thing to do ever. And they all go for it, right? It's like, rah, you know, then your friend starts getting pummeled. Right? Why? Because that's revenge. That's just human nature. And you can do that on a country level as well. So, sorry, a short answer to that would be um, uh, the, the qualifier for any conspiracy for me is, does it benefit the, the greater good? So, we, you know, did we, was it done? Did the, the, did the ends justify the means? Did the greater good benefit? I don't care what the act was. I mean, if you look at, you say in the long run, you know, sometimes when you look down the road, it's like, wow, it was probably good we did that. So how do you get the United States to start gr taking a much, much more aggressive foothold in the Middle East when it comes to oil? Look, we don't have an infinite supply. There's not, it's musical chairs. There's not enough oil to go around now, especially with China ramping up. So we're grabbing as much as we can. Russia quietly grabbed Venezuela. You know, they sent their entire 
Atlantic fleet down there at one point to blockade off Venezuela so that we wouldn't go grab it. So we took the Middle East. How do you get people in the Middle East? Well, you got to make a target over there. And so not, was 9-11 a great way of getting us into the Middle East? Yeah. Yeah, it was. And it paid off. We've got permanent bases in most of the oil producing countries. And it, even before 9-11, think of the, the war. I know you guys are old enough to remember. We went into Kuwait. Right. That was the whole Operation Gulf, you know, Desert Storm. Hey, right? you know, people don't understand why we were in there. We were in there because oil. the mill because they took it. The Middle East took one of their own. And on their way out, they were so pissed off that the Americans were coming in there and grabbing the oil, the thousand oil wells that were there, that they dynamited all of them. And it took us two years to freaking cap the fires. That then we and why do you? Well, it's also one of the reasons why we took revenge on them. It's like burn our oil wells. How dare you? And we crushed them. So anyway, uh, the, the greater good is is the, the is one of the big things, the qualifiers for any any conspiracy. For me and it's it doesn't it i'll give you one more real quick it was in my book which was uh the panama canal it i will take exclusive for this one right panama canal fantastic conspiracy nobody knows about it. i'm one of the few people in the world now you guys that even know about this conspiracy this is an like panama canal real is is a real conspiracy like, yeah yeah it absolutely is panama canal the biggest, most expensive toll road ever, military choke point of all choke points when it comes to the, the navies, right? You know, and it was, it was a big deal. Why is it a conspiracy? It's a conspiracy because we killed a lot of people doing it. And you're thinking, what are you talking about? It's like, okay, um, any engineering project, people die if it's big enough. Like you build a dam, people are going to fall, trucks are going to tip over, people die at construction sites. We lost, I think, 70 people building the Hoover Dam. We lost the better part of 6,000 men building the Panama Canal. And that was a big ditch. How did they die? And then, you, you know, I'd say, well, malaria and yellow fever. They, it was the jungle after all. And you say, well, that's not a big surprise. People die in the jungle. It's like, yeah, 6,000 men. And then you come back and say, well, we didn't know they were going to die. I say, oh, yeah, we did. <laughs> we knew full well they were going to die. The reason we knew this is because we didn't start the Panama Canal. The French did. French did it the, the 1880s, roughly. The French came over. They used to be a big deal, friends. They came over and they started working on this and they were just dropping dead everywhere. Mosquitoes were just chomping on them. And they lost 22, 23,000 men at some point. It was so many men. It was like Paris. There were, there were families in, in Paris that were revolting. They were protesting, saying, get these guys out of here. You're just killing them as fast as they can get off the boat. So they just dropped all their shovels and they left. And the Americans saying, hey, free shovels. We go down there and we think, okay, we're going we're gonna to jump on this. But they knew full well. It's like, oh, we're going to lose some guys. And that's where the conspiracy comes in. Remember, a conspiracy just by definition is when three or more people conspire to commit something that's either illegal or unethical okay so the conspiracy is that they knew that the deaths would happen but they ordered it anyway well didn't order it they just didn't tell them so okay. if you signed up so like it's like oh yeah great risk. job for you in panama and it's like are they gonna am i gonna tell you as the employer that there's a one in eight chance of you dying just flat out dying no i'm not gonna tell you i need you down there i need bodies i need people digging stuff with bulldozers and stuff and so they didn't tell people. And that's, that's how it worked. And uh, again, it's, it, it's it, another quick thing about conspiracies, which is the, the definition, the, the media will come against conspiracies, but you don't understand that conspiracies, unfortunately for the media, is part of our legal system. So for example, if Lance down there decides he's going to rob a bank, right? You will be, you haven't robbed a bank, have you? You're okay. You haven't. You haven't robbed a bank? Okay. Well, you're working on it. All right. So you rob the bank. He gets charged with armed robbery, right? But if Ben and Jesse and Lance, the three of you decide to rob a bank together, a lot of people don't know this. You will get charged twice. You get charged with armed robbery and conspiracy to commit armed robbery, which means you worked as a team. That's a whole nother deal. And so, but the, so the media, you know, they, they don't use the word conspiracy. They will use the word scandal or they will use the word tragedy. If, if they use those words, that's sanctioned by the media. Everything else though is a conspiracy. 
So like the Enron thing where Enron robbed people of billions of dollars, you know, that oil and gas company, that's a scandal. But everything, you know, any other thing, unless it's proven, you know, unless it goes through the court system, well, then it's just a conspiracy. That's crazy. Sorry, I ramble. Go. What, what do you want um, to I wanted to go back on the pop, pop culture. Um, I see, like, when we watch the, the documentary a lot, the, you mentioned the Truman Show, you know, that's in your YouTube bio as well. I read that. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, you say that with the, first of all, um, you say that, we're basically Truman, right? We're living in this dome. We don't know about it. It's just what we've known about forever, what we've learned, what we've lived through. Yeah. Um, would you say that there is like some external factors controlling the dome? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. It's completely artificial and completely... In fact, um, I'll use another pop culture reference. Um, and I don't think they even realized it when they made it. Some years ago, uh, the guys from South Park made an episode called Earth Cancelled, which was brilliant, absolutely freaking brilliant where they basically aliens were were treating the entire world as a reality television show and our ratings were starting to slip so they were going to wipe out the earth and cancel it uh so yeah do i think that that um everything is everything outside here is is controlled yeah but i think they let a lot of the stuff on the internal kind of play itself out like we would with terrarium you know we set up the terrarium we put the little little creatures in a couple plants and we stare at it and we watch it for a while and it's amazing. There's some wonderful videos on um, on YouTube about s completely sealed terrariums that can go on for years and years and years, and they don't need anything. You know, you just put a little water um, to start and some some light, and the ecosystem just keeps self perpetuating um, without humans, of course. Humans are the only ones to, not to use the line from the Matrix, but um, every other every other organism, natural equilibrium, we're the only things that tend to uh, wreak havoc. So does that help? Yeah. Cool. So are we still on the topic of pop culture? Yeah. All right. Well, so, kind of. Yeah. Yeah. So I had a list of like, you know, I, I, I've ha always had this idea, right? And it's yeah. that I, before I knew about, you know, flat earth, there's like a uh, dome, stuff like that. Right. It was right. that there, like, there's the, there's the idea that Hollywood is controlled. Right. And oh, I yeah. always thought, yeah, well, yeah. why would Hollywood be controlled if there's certain themes in movies? Right that would kind of go against the sense of a greater power, right? Like Star Wars, like, like why would, you know, why would they make a movie that's going to be so big that's about rebels taking over a, like, higher power? You know what I mean? Like, Why do you allow... Okay, well, I've got mixed feelings about that because I know that when it comes to media, which has been completely suppressed as of this year, media is meant to inspire and distract people. So you want to let media kind of do their thing. And if people want to make the, the hero's journey has never really changed over the centuries, which is, you know, the, 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 the plucky upstart, you know, it's like, you know, you, that, that, what do they call it? The, the character arc. And you have to have that, you know, the rebels going against an overpowering thing. You know, that's, that's an inspiring story. But that's all it is to most people. You put it in a sci-fi setting as long as it's not too grounded to real life. Now, if there was a movie about um, an uprising in the United States wiping out the, the U.S. government, you know, uh, you know, an, uh, basically a how-to movie. Like, how yeah, did that that, happen? Like, how did this yeah, that's probably happen? not going to go very far in the production world. Yeah. I, are there hidden producers? Yeah, you bet there are. Are there, you know, they can, they can lean Hollywood in certain ways. Like when we've had wars in the past, you know everything from world war ii all the way up until the, the gulf war and past you see an influx of more war movies for example not just because hollywood knows you know that we could sell them to veterans because the you know the powers that be it's like no no we'll promote those um sometimes it's a fluke like when um top gun came out and there were all these people joined the navy because it's like oh top gun you know that's that's kind of a fluky thing but the other movies you know you can tell they've got that stamp of you know you want you know the government's the highest power and there's no one above that um there's uh, there's so many different little cool little examples but it doesn't it's okay oh you want to look for something fun if once you get into flat earth you become hyper aware of globes and backgrounds that's the thing that's freaked me out for the last two or three years and that is because you know i i watched tell a lot of media and i've been re-watching a lot of media you know so it's just watching and you'll see in shots 
because you don't have to have the producer actually work on the script. Sometimes you'll, you know, there's so many producers in a movie and a television show. Sometimes they'll just pay money to to uh, have influence on a set. It's like, yeah, I'd like to donate thirty thousand dollars to this television show up. So, okay, what do you want for that? Oh, I'd like to do some, you know, in, some influence on this particular set. You know, just just decorating the set. And most directors will be like, fine, go nuts. It's like thirty thousand is thirty thousand. And what you'll see is globes. <laughs> Okay. Globes are freaking everywhere in the background, and people don't even know that they're there. And I was like, fine, you want a globe in a classroom? That's that's given. Why is there a globe in this particular doctor's office? Why is there a globe in that detective's office? Why is there a globe? They're everywhere. They're everywhere. And all these, and again, you only have to see them for one or two seconds, and you don't even notice them. But when you start getting into this stuff, it's like, oh god, there it is again. Sometimes they're little and brown, big and blue. It's like they don't have to be there. It's like, oh, it's coincidence. Not that many shows. It's not. Yeah. No. I, so, so I wanted to do a little segment, maybe just for fun. Uh, yeah. I have a list of movies, and I just want you to maybe quickly, or if you want to go on about it, what the truth is in that movie. Because I, I know you have definitely uh, seen a lot. All right. So number I've one, probably seen it. Yeah. We'll start with the obvious, The Matrix. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, you, what what's the matrix about? No, what's what's the truth in it that you see? What truth? Do oh, you oh, see? okay. What what little nods in it? Um, that this world is potentially virtual on the outside. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, not just the matrix, but the thirteenth floor that came out in the in the same year, which was even better. The matrix was really slick. It was a nice polished version, but the the bigger think piece was the thirteenth floor. But yeah, I'm sorry, real fast. Um, matrix. Could it be possible? Yes. You gotta remember, The Matrix is 20, 21 years old now, gonna be 22 years old now. Yeah. And a lot of people didn't get it. It's like, oh, wow, he dodged bullets. Very fun to watch, but a lot of people, even now, uh, just didn't get the whole concept, which is interesting because the media, the, the entertainment com companies are desperately trying to create a virtual reality which we can tap into, but they can't figure it out. Um, and I don't think they're going to because right now, the best you can do is sight and sound. Right, and there's five senses. Or, you know, you, you 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 don't have smell or taste or touch, and the only way you can do those is if you tap in to the to the brain directly. Yeah, the health health insurance companies are never going to allow that to happen. So, same reason why, by the way, we don't have the the purge, oh, yeah. the the whole pur the whole purge movie concept. Yeah, great movie concept, completely unrealistic because the insurance companies would be hell no, we're not. You'd have to sign a waiver basically saying your insurance isn't covered that night. Yeah. Which meant that yeah. everyone would stay inside with guns pointed out. It's like blockout and days would, for insurance, which is... Yeah, yeah. Strange. People would blow away. No one's going anywhere. Everyone would protect their own property because their insurance wouldn't be protected. There'd be arsonists everywhere. That would be the big thing. No one would be shooting each other. People would just be throwing cans of gas and road flares at buildings. It'd be awful. I, interesting concept, though. Anyway, go on. Uh, Blade Runner. Oh, yeah. Blade Runner. That's definitely Blade crazy. Runner, the, the only thing that stuck out to me, well, yeah, first off, it was a dystopian future, kind of dystopian future that never happened, right? It was way ahead of its time. Wonderful, wonderful movie. Um, but the only thing that really stuck out to, that stood the test of time for me was the, um, the modified Turing test, which was the robot test. Ooh, you, yeah. would give, you would give the androids to see if they were human or not. And that stuck with me for years. Um, I thought that was fascinating because everyone's been kind of hinting. It's like, oh, yeah, we're going to – we've always talked about movies where you know, the robots can be indistinguishable from humans. Um, you know, We've thought about that all the way going back to the early 50s. It's never going to – it's not going to happen with the tech we've got. We just don't have the ability to do it. We can't even do it with text. I mean, yeah, you get fooled every once in a while with a chat bubble that's doing an auto thing, you know, and you might buy the first six lines. You don't know if they're a real person. The point, are you real? But like with voice, we can't even do it with voice. Um, the movie Her, that That's was the um, uh, done with the, the voice was done by Scarlett Johansson. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, why didn't they use a Siri type voice? Well, because it's not believable. Siri will never come off as as human. It doesn't matter how you know. The, it sounds relatively good. But you don't ever mistake Siri for a real person. And that's the crazy thing is that one day we'll get to that point inevitably. Like I, uh, I don't, I don't know. That's tough. It's tough. You ask any developer. We're that's a huge leap, and especially if you get into the whole self-aware thing. 
but I, I won't even get into that's that. That's the cool thing Meaning about compute, the test remember, is because it's like there's like a there's a collective like consciousness with them, and it's like all you have to do is find ways to like find the little details and then just take them out. If you if you can do it, but convincing people, look up if you get a chance, look up the Turing test. You know, it was designed because computer guys early in the fifties thought, "Holy smokes, what if we actually start building robots that can trick us?" Um, we haven't even come close. We haven't even made it to level two yet. Not only level three, and by the way, level three robots. Not to get too geeky, but the we we don't have the battery technology for that. You have to go with at that point. Again, kind of there's you run into a. a, a a hurdle, a brick wall, basically, that you can't you can't scale, and that is the Terminator robots ran off small um, atomic devices, you know, small nuclear weapons, mm -hmm. <laughs> and that. Sorry, once you build that, you're basically letting uh, atomic weapons into the general public. It would take two seconds for bad people to take apart those robots and harvest those things, and then you got suitcase bombs everywhere. Ugh, awful. Anyway, go on. Uh, Star Wars. I know we kind of touched on that. But... Um, Star Wars really, see, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big critic of Star Wars because I think George Lucas pulled up short for the toys by the time, you know, that we've all heard the rumors that, uh, the third movie, by the way, was, was supposed to have a Wookiee planet instead of the stupid little Ewok things, yeah, I heard about but that. he, he caved in and that would have been so, it would have been such a fantastic end. It would have been way better. Way, way better. Everybody knew that. But he wasn't going for the fans. He was going for the bucks. And to be fair, I mean, he ended up selling out to Disney for oh four and a half billion dollars. Um, but the, nothing else. There was no. There was no underlying message. It was the classic. And come on, <laughs> George Lucas. He ripped off Lord of the Rings so badly that by the time he got to the third movie, he didn't even change the title. Return of the Jedi, really? Return of the King, Return of the Jedi, really? You're just gonna just gonna take that? And um, I mean, that was that was basically the the character arc. He he stole everything. George Lucas never had an original idea in his life, and he just grabbed everything from everybody, and he lucked out. Every the the wonderful documentaries on the making of Star Wars, the the thing it, it had already tanked. No one, none of the focus groups liked it. They lucked out because they hit this nice little technological wave where the special effects were it was the first movie where the special effects drove the movie yeah. and when they did that you know yeah the, the, you know, they didn't even have you know out the obi-wan was the only decent actor you know everybody else was was nobody's and the the special effects drove the movie so no it was it's a wonderful benchmark for when science fiction changed but there was no message that carried with it what about uh star trek Star Trek was a utopia. They one of the few utopias that they kept out there for a long time, and it inspired tech companies, you know, to make things, you know, the portable devices and flat screens and crap like that. Um, but it was a utopia that was. T in fact, there's been comic strips. I think it was called the SS Utopia, as a matter of fact, that that kind of made fun of it because it was too optimistic of the human race. Oh, yeah. There are these gr great lines when um, my favorite Star Trek movie, I know it's blasphemous for some Star Trek guys, was uh, First Contact, when um, the, the whole Borg one, where there's this line where John Luke was talking about how human, human beings, when it got to a certain point, transcended money, right? Money wasn't our driving force because the, the woman from, because they had time traveled, and she goes, how much does this ship cost? And his answer was, well, you know, it really doesn't matter now. We're, we're just doing it to better the human race. And everyone, you know, it, it was all about exploring and not dominating the Starfleet with this shiny beacon. That's like, yeah, it's really, really ambitious and all. But the uh, truth is, all the other sci-fi movies, space movies, you know, along those lines, like, um, oh, Firefly and uh, Serenity, you know, the movie. That's a more realistic look at it. It's all about the frickin' resources. You know, yeah. people are only out in space to get frickin' paid. That's the only reason they're out there. You don't, don't tell me that you've got these wonderful exploring things. The one thing I will say about Star Trek, though, is that it boosted NASA in terms of exposure because NASA used Star Trek. In fact, I, when I went down to the Kennedy Space Center down in Houston, they had uh, a Star Trek space shuttle 
a wooden one. You couldn't even walk in it, but it was there. In fact, I think they had lost the licensing rights to it because Paramount, Paramount didn't want to uh, have their name in the Space Center because it was like an aged amusement park type thing. But it helped NASA bridge the gaps. So it was like it was something that NASA could say, oh, yeah, this is what we're aspiring to be. Yeah. And they could just do that all the time because, like, look, they were doing the work for us. The Starfleet was literally NASA hundreds of years from now. And it was that was very clever that NASA jumped on that, but yeah, you know, never ever materialized for NASA. So I think it's a wonderful idea. To we're we're not that good, and I I, know, I don't mean technology wise. I mean we're not that morally. <laughs> yeah, there'll, there'll never be a point when we're like that. It's impossible, you know. We can't yeah. even you know get somebody to like we'll watch politics. You can't get somebody to do like the smallest thing without there being some sort of dude. Incident. We fight over toilet paper. Yeah, exactly. when we didn't even need to buy toilet paper. <laughs> don't tell me that. Yeah, don't tell me it'd be you know peace in our time. You know that whole thing, you know, world peace. Like my ass. No, no. I I wrote a survival manual called Empty Shelves when I said look. In fact, there was there was a line I did in a rant um, called um, "Just a Mask." where I used a line, it was one of my favorite lines from uh, Joker, Heath Ledger's Joker, where he was talking about, he was basically trying to show Batman, it's like, why are you fighting for these people? They're animals, right? He, and the line was, is that our moral, their moral code, I'll see if I can do it verbatim, their moral code is a bad joke, dropped at the first sign of trouble. He goes, you wait, when the chips are down, these civilized people, they'll eat each other. And that was, you know, and, and he tried to do that with the, with the fairies, right? Yeah, the you know, boats. both had detonators switched to the other. And Batman's like, no, there'll be no explosion. They won't blow each other up. And it's like, of course they would. <laughs> it's like they would blow the prisoner ship up in two seconds. And the, the, the wolf ships would blow up. And, and I know Christopher Nolan, optimistic. He was trying to do the whole Batman, you know, rooting, giving Batman something to fight for. Because if the ships would have blown up, Batman would have quit. I'm gonna be like, that's it. I'm out of here. Screw these guys. What about uh, the Maze Runner? Have you seen? The, the... I have seen the Maze Runner because there was was there three? Yeah, there's three, three of them. Yeah, yeah I, I think I did watch all three. That's a fascinating concept. In, I mean, that's a oof, that's a dystopian sort of matrixy kind of thing, but it's real, and there's some like government, you know, testing stuff involved. It's mixes, it's, the Maze Runner thing mixed enough genres that, uh, it, could you influence people? All right, short version is, you didn't have to do everything in the Maze Runner to influence people to do things. Oh, yeah. You could, you could, you can turn people, I mean, in all sorts of different ways right now without doing, I mean, look what we did this year, right? 20, 20 million, 20 million um, vaccination dos doses are being sent out. They'll be done, they'll be out there by the end of December, which is in two weeks. We did that and people are lining up to get them. They're fighting over, you know, which groups, like which to get them first. And we did that just by basically turning off the toys for a year. That's all we did. I mean, you can, can, you can make people do a lot. Um, there, there's a line, you know, people believe basically anything the, the media tells them. Um, I joked with somebody a few months ago, I said, you know, if the media came out and said, starting Monday, we're really recommending that people wear polka dot masks. I guarantee there would be mothers fighting at Hobby Lobby for every swatch of, of polka dot fabric there, there was out there. And that's just because the, the media, you know, everyone believe, believes everything the media says. And anyone that says there's no such thing as fake news, I have two sentences for them. I say, fine, there's no such thing as fake news. Everything on CNN is absolutely true. And everything on Fox News is absolutely true. Hmm. Well, you can't resolve both of them because, you know, you're one, you're red team or blue team. And so it's like, oh, so there is fake news. And then the fights begin. It's like, no, it's them. Red lies, blue lies. You know, oh, God. This never ends. Yeah, what are your can't wait. I mean, 2020, by the way, 2021, <laughs> you're going to be wishing for 2020 before 2020 ends over. It is going to be <laughs> so much fun. <laughs> It's gonna be super, super entertaining. Get popcorn ready. 
What are your thoughts on the whole uh, like Trump campaign with the whole uh, fake news and stuff like that? What, what do you? Oh, what the, tr the Trump campaign and fake news. It's it's a distraction. That's all it is. You gotta remember that people in Europe. Um, friends of mine in Europe, they've been protesting all over the place about the lockdowns, but we haven't been. Why? Well, because misdirection. It's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. We started at the beginning of the year, as soon as the weather got good with Black Lives Matter. You know, it's like, fine, I like my causes as much as anything, but when you put them on TV night after night, how many Portland had, what, 100 nights straight? I'm just being just rioting, rioting, rioting. So was anyone going to protest anything else? No, hell, you might run into a BLM protest if you tried to protest something on yourself. And just when the weather started turning south, because we're fair weather protesters in the United States, just when the weather started turning south, the election controversy. And so we just gave people the election stuff for the rest of the year. And that's what it was. No, Trump. The arguments that are going down in the conspiracy circle, it's like, oh, no, Trump's going to come back and Democrats cheated. Right. And I'm, I don't vote, but I got to come back and say, how do you think Trump got in in the first place? Yeah, exactly. You know, Watch the first seven minutes of a Michael Moore movie called um, uh, I'm not left or right. I mean, I mean, my family's right, but uh, it's called Fahrenheit 11, nine, not nine 11, but 11, nine first seven minutes where is this montage of news stories just nonstop about how Trump had no chance, no chance. He's not a politician. He's been married several times. They go, there's, he's the exact, there's no way, even the Republicans are like, yeah, he's probably going to bring down the whole party. And then that night he wins, right? And I don't mind if I swear here, where Michael Moore at the end of that montage goes, how the fuck did this happen? <laughs> it's true. Because and, and the Democrats were really, really angry. You got to remember the beginning, the Democrats were saying he cheated, he cheated, but they couldn't figure out how he did it. They immediately thought it was the Russians. They thought, well, it was a computer hack. Yeah, maybe. But you weren't watching. That was the big thing. You weren't watching for it. You never thought that someone would actually cheat. So the Democrats cheating this time around and the Republicans are really bent out of shape. Come on. That's like, the funny thing I always thought was that Trump said on the 2016 campaign, he was like, if I don't win, then this is the most corrupt election ever, and it will be done by the Russians. And then everybody on the left was like, oh, yeah, you cheated with the Russians. And he's like, right. well, it's like, well, didn't he just say that you guys were going to do that? So, right. like, it's it's a weird, like, situation. I, I'm kind and of confused on that. I was always I was always skeptical that anyone was even thinking it was going to be a horse race because the the media is ninety percent left. It's like, look, the media controls what gets out to the public. If the media wants, the media can say anything they want, and or or not say it. I mean, they kill or rate or elevate stories. And so, how could like right now, you know, the Trump's doing the whole you know protesting this and, and you know throwing the lawyers at everybody, and the media is completely downplaying. It's like, oh, it's never going to happen. It's never going to happen. And then. What if it did? Mm -hmm. You know, right now we're working. Well, right, right, right. That would probably be like a, a you know, we'd all be on fire if the it maybe, I th maybe I think except the left. Nuts, I have I think. what I have learned though this year is that the left is really terrible at protests. <laughs> just awful. They just don't. The right is different. The right, not to use a tagline, but the right fights. The right will burn things down. The right, they're just. Crow Magnon compared to the left, right? And it's like, rah, you know, they'll drive trucks into things. The left, you know, yeah, they throw rocks and they use umbrellas and leaf blowers and stuff like that. But it's so, you know, all it takes is, you know, and the police are having their, their, they were having their way with them with rubber bullets and tear gas and stuff like that. If all it took is just a few live rounds and, and people scatter. The right would not scatter after live rounds, right? Be like, oh, get, get the rest of the guns out of the truck. It'd be awful. It'd be awful. So yeah, if if Trump ends up winning, I don't know. I I think that the media wouldn't even acknowledge it. They would just say Trump claims to win. The media would never do that. But again, we're coming to the clock's ticking. This is what makes it different now? We got three weeks to inauguration. So either the inauguration happens or it doesn't. I, I think he's not going to get it off. I, well, here's the thing. I think. He well, you think the inauguration's not going to come off? No, no, no. I think I think Trump can't get it off. And I think he's not going to get it off in time. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't. The odds say he won't. Yeah. You know, but hey, at the same time, I, I can't discount it entirely because of all the weird stuff that's happened. I mean, it wouldn't surprise me if all of a sudden all it takes is one weird. You got to remember, there's also the Emergency Act, where all you have to do is do some sort of false flag. I'm really surprised the left hasn't thought of this yet, which is if you create like a false flag event, a big one. 
the president can come in. Oh yeah, emergency powers act. Uh, no one's doing anything until this false flag thing's resolved. I'm still president, and no, you know, since it, you know it's not a third term, they would have no choice. So we'll see. I, again, three weeks and counting. If it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, I still think it's a distraction at this point because right now all they all they care about is rolling out the vaccines, which were, by the way, we're not supposed to come out in December. I had to make a rant. My rant's coming out on Tuesday. I wasn't supposed to make that rant for several months, and now it's coming out. So yeah. we'll see. All right. So hey, back Mark, to our, uh, oh, my bad. I have, I have a quick question. I'm like, what are your thoughts like on the on the topic of, of Trump and politics? What are your thoughts on uh, QAnon? You, you heard of like the like the whole QAnon conspiracy? Somebody, I had, I had somebody ask me about that. Uh, like um, a journalist team. They were at, they were, there was a big outfit too. They were trying to, uh, they were out trying to do a story on QAnon and I go, they were a thing at some point, but the problem with QAnon, which goes back to the whole QAnon was supposed to be the deep throat, not the porn term, the deep, the deep throat of the news, right? Remember, deep throat used to be an actual <laughs> news term, right? Back, back in, back in the day, um, which is they were supposed to give up the goods, right? You can't come out and say, oh yeah, we're, we're doing, you know, we've got all this inside info. Eventually you got to give up the goods, right? You got to tell people. You just can't do these cryptic messages constantly and then uh, without anything to back it up. It was kind of like they were jumping on the bandwagon of the Snowden thing and, you know, other people that released documents that, you know, tried to steal, thing from, steal things from the government. I just didn't see anything materialize from, from QAnon. So it's a nice idea, but I also think that it's it's a way. I think it's I think it's a nice way to lure out people. <laughs> it's you know people potential anarchists, you know, uh, people that are good at, at hacking. I think it's a good way to draw them out and uh, see who's willing to disrupt the government if you wanted to. I I don't. Kieran's never shown me anything. Sorry, I they nothing nothing enough to where where, where I I we got to remember I look through conspiracy circles and conspiracy forums, lots of them. Uh, one of my favorite old ones has been around for years is Godlike Productions, and they um I haven't seen a QAnon story in there months months and months and months. I haven't seen one. So. Yeah, I oh, again, nice nice story, too. nice t-shirts. What have they done? It's like they, they, they show they present Trump as playing 40 chess against this this super hit. Oh elite. yeah yeah okay. It's like, I, don't, me, I don't know man. Let me address that. The Trump savior, the the Trump Jesus, basically. Um, yeah. Sure. Okay. Every president, there has not been a president with any real power since Eisenhower, and that goes all the way back to 1960. Every president since then has been increasingly better at being in the media. In fact, the last four presidents have been great indicators of that. Um, there's been different political people that said, you will never see a president now I mean, the last 20, 30 years. If the president is not good on television, he's not going to be on television. You're not, you're not going to see that. Um, Obama uh, was a fantastic example of that, where um, if you guys remember... Uh, uh, you guys remember the Superman movies, right? Recently, mm -hmm. right? So you remember the Black General in the Superman movies? Uh, the 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 guy who was always looking for Superman. Uh, well, anyway, you, you can look him up if you get a chance. He he played the the head of the, the the U.S. Armed Forces, Black General. Anyway, he was being interviewed for for that movie in some radio station, blah blah blah, and they were talking about Obama. I don't know what made him do this, but he gave it up. He's going, please. He goes, he goes, I'm the guy that coached Obama. I gave him the acting lessons. When you're watching him at the podium, you're listening to me. Well, didn't take too long before other people picked up on that little sound bite and they were all over him. He backpedaled, never talked about it since. I'm sure because you know his handlers are like, yeah, you don't ever, ever want to talk about that. Um, Obama was a, was a great example of that. I'm, I know I'm backing up a little bit. Um, Every, every president that's out there right now is just a figurehead. They're a front man in a band. They don't get to do anything. Again, remember, the United States, we convinced the general public through movies mostly and television that the president had the power to open up a briefcase with a giant red button and hit it and we could destroy Russia. 
Never, ever, 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 ever would that ever be allowed to happen. One man in the United States government does not have that sort of power in the, in the United States, in the military arsenal. But it's a great little story to put out there. Does Trump have any more power than any other president? No, he does not. He makes $400,000 a year as president. Um, he was, when they found him, and I'm, I'm not trying to make him into a bad guy. I'm just saying that the media propped him up. The media built him, which was when, and you can look, there's some wonderful documentaries about him. When they found him, when the producers found him before The Apprentice, he was just a fading businessman in New York with everything in his office was worn down. He was, you know, signing his name to anything he could. He'd already just wiped out that business opportunity with that casino in, in Atlantic City. He had not done much, but with The Apprentice, he built and built. Remember, he did like, what, 12 seasons of that damn thing? It spun off into other stuff. The office, you know, the, the whole studio, there was no, you know, they were like, they were in his office. There was no Trump boardroom. That was all completely manufactured. Even the elevator was fake, right? It was all completely fake. So having him jump to president, the reason why it worked so well is because, again, we, a reality television star as president seems like a ridiculous thing, but we had already come so close prior. Uh, Jesse the Body Ventura, you know, was already governor of Minnesota. Um, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, the governor of California. And he almost became president. The only problem was he was born in Austria. And they had to change, they were going to have to change the constitution. They were really, really close, to, close to getting that in. No, uh, I'll give you a quick story and then I'll let you compare to this. The last president with any real power. I don't, you know, President or Trump being the most brilliant man in the world. Right? He's playing 4D chess. No, I'm sorry, not buying it. Here's why. It's like, you can be as smart as you want. Unless you have the influence, you don't have the influence. Unless you can make the phone calls, there's only so much you can do. Uh, Dwight Eisenhower was the head the head of all allied forces in World War II. He was basically the guy that pushed the button that says, D-Day, go. Right? He was above Patton. He was above uh, MacArthur. He was above everybody. Right? When he became president, he wasn't a military guy anymore. So when he found out that Area 51 was being built, it's a wonderful story, and I absolutely believe it. Because uh, there was this old guy, this old military guy that told the story on his deathbed, and he just chuckled about it because he thought it was funny, and it's exactly what would happen. He called him up. He, he got the phone number for Roswell, right? I'm sorry, not Roswell, um, Groom Lake, Area 51. And he says, yeah, I'd like to come out and take a tour, right? And they say, yeah, sorry, you're a civilian now. You don't have clearance. The president only, you know, only has so much clearance. He can't do stuff on his own. He's just the public, you know, front. front. And he got kind, of, kind of bent out of shape, you know, being that he was you know, the, the biggest military. He was a five-star general at some point. And he goes, yeah, so I'm going to call up my friends, my, you know, my general buddies over in the first army who are still over there. We're going to take a whole battalion out to Area 51 and we're going to come in and see it for ourselves. You know, let me in now. <laughs> and he absolutely could have done this. The point was he, he had that sort of clout, you know, even in 1960, you know, but 15 years after World War II, he could have done this. So when anyone says that Trump is playing 4D chess and he's, he's got this plans within plans, like, oh yeah, well, he's, he's totally going to outwit it. It's like, no. And I'm not trying to be insulting when I say this, but before The Apprentice, no, I'll take it back even further. If his last name wasn't Trump, he would be a used car salesman on the wrong side of the tracks in Jersey. That's it. Okay, you I mean, can sorry. He, Trump he, as he, much he, as you want. We're okay with it. Uh, we so, well, no, no. We I'm just saying that if, if you look at his backstory, he, it was his dad. His dad created the brand name, and it's a, it's a catchy name, and it's a positive name. You know, Trump card. You know, this trumps that. And it's like, it's, it's a catchy name, and advertisers jumped on it, and especially in the New York area, and he rode that horse until the legs fell off Did you see and the, then he uh, rode the torch Times, the new york times investigation into how he made his money in the beginning have you oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i mean the whole well, the, that, well he undervalued properties and then he yeah. they created the uh, the trump family thing where like they're like all right i need a water heater and then they'd give him they'd sell him a water heater for like triple the price and then they're like yeah okay so they didn't have to pay the the tax of gift money 
through uh, Fred Trump and his state. If you look, if you look into anyone, this is the hypocrisy of our of our country. If you look into anyone that's made a huge amount of money in our country, it's either happened because of blind luck, good timing, or both, or something unethical. I mean, there's a reason why they made it. I mean, the, you ruthlessly claw your way to the top and you can, yeah, you can make a lot of money. You're going to be stepping on a lot of people and burning a lot of bridges on the way. Um, in Trump's case, he, he did a, He took it as far as he could. He caught a break. Honestly, even the producers that created the show had no idea that it was going to catch on. And they really, no one, again, they, they snuck him in into the whole presidency thing. And, and did, you know, did Biden, did Biden's team cheat? Yeah, probably. But what op okay, okay, one more thing before we go off to a different different thing. The thing that bugged me about the whole Democratic side of the Biden thing was, and if you follow the political stuff, Biden had no campaign. He got crushed. Remember, Hillary destroyed him during during the last time. And the, this time he wasn't even in the running. He was like, you know, at one point they were going, Oh, Bernie Sanders, that's gonna be the guy. And then they got scared to death. It's like, oh wow, we we're actually talking about Bernie Sanders, really? Bernie Sanders so they, they, okay. they brought Biden back in. Right. It's like, oh, Biden's the man. Right. It's like, whatever. No, what bugged me about the Democratic Party is you got to remember the almost the entire entertainment industry is left. Right. How do you you heard the term fighting fire with fire? Right. So if Trump's a reality television star and that's how he got in. So literally, that's how I got in. Right. You know, other than the cheating part, you know, he still resonates with the public because people's like, oh, he's a great businessman and all this stuff. Right. Why didn't she just beat him with a better actor? Why, you know, there are so, and because the left is all entertainment, you could so many people to choose from. Oh my God. Uh, George Clooney, just to start, it's, you know, because any actor, Oprah, what, why the hell? Oprah was actually considering at one point. What the hell? Oprah could have just crushed it with her demographics. Absolutely crushed it. Everyone in America. Well, well, and there's some that wouldn't have voted for her, but a lot would have. Uh, or I don't know, every guy, every actor that ever played the president, ever, and there's been a slew of them, right? Harrison Ford, Bill Pullman, uh, Morgan Freeman, twice, and he's black. Uh, how many other people have played the president over the years? You know, Martin Sheen, you know, well, maybe not so much now. <laughs> but, I mean, there's so many people that have played the president. It's like, why didn't you just throw them in there? Why didn't you throw them in there? Why did you go with a straight-up politician? Why, you know, why not go for an actor? Because I, I think the whole thing was that especially the way the media handled it is that like trump's not a good politician he's not doing no I, everybody was like oh we like 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 all the left was like they're like okay trump is is a non-traditional politician and he's doing bad so now don't you kind of want like a good politician because when yeah, trump won started. against clinton it was because clinton is one of the most corrupt worst politicians of all time she was never going to win she had a terrible reputation so it was like people were sick of people like Hillary Clinton. So they're like, we want Trump because Trump isn't typical. So I think what it was is now it's like, okay, now Trump is kind of like this pompous, you know, a-hole at the top. And he's not very good at what he's doing. We don't like the way he handles things. So yeah. let's bring in like, like Joe Biden, who's like, you know, he's all like, yeah, like, you know. Let's I, you, could, you couldn't whatever. come up with anyone, anyone better. I mean, the he... I mean, come on, we've been listening to his speeches for a number of years. He's never been exactly solid. He's always kind of been kind of out there. I just think that if you wanted to to drive the point home, there's so many people you could have chosen. from. Because, again, the, the rules have now changed. You don't have to worry about choosing. A, I know where you're going with this. You didn't have to choose a politician this time because the mold has been broken because you got a reality. I mean, for you didn't go with an actor, an actual actor. You went with a reality television star. Again, blows me away. I'll use, I use the quote from um, uh, Carrie Fisher when they were asking her about some, um, you know, how how reality television is affecting you know the entertainment biz, and she laughed. And it was one of the best quotes she had before she died. She goes, she goes, you don't get it. She goes, if it's on television, it's not real. Oh, yeah. And it's true. And it's true. I mean, the documentaries, reality television, anyone will tell you, you know, it's just, it, it's, there's no difference between the production techniques in a reality television show and a normal thing. Uh, in fact, even documentaries, I, I, I thought it was so funny. Like, I did a National Geographic thing where I, I use this as an example where I met the host for the first time six times. Meaning it was like, hey, my name's, hey, Mark, how are you? You know, we like, we met each other from across, like, hey. And it's like, okay, we're going to shoot this again. And it's like, we had to do this over and over and over. 
and we kept shooting these different shots and and our people were kind of getting annoyed because they started realizing it's like wow it's not there's nothing spontaneous about it at all it's like no because you have to get the shot and I mean, no producer of uh, the behind the what is it? it's called behind the belt behind the curve behind the curve my bad i had a brain thing uh how much of that was like that how much of it was staged or you know there not as much staged but when you shoot for seven months and you have to whittle it down to a hundred minutes oh yeah okay. you can you basically cut out you can do so people don't get it you can do so much with editing so so much with editing. Yeah, that's the thing about Took. documentary filmmaking is that it's like you're capturing the life and then you're making a story out of it. You're not just right. telling the story of life; you're making a story out of life. Yeah, and you got to make it somewhat entertaining. And so you know, taking taking shots is the the green button shot, brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And I even consented to it, which was it's like yeah, I, I know what you're doing. It's a good gag, which is when I was at the Kennedy Space Center. And I sat down, they had, you know, it was a very aged system out there in Kennedy. It wasn't even HD. And they had these monitors above us and this giant, there's only one control, one button. You hit it, big green button. It had to have been four inches wide. And you hit it and, you know, the things play up on the screen. You sit back and you watch this thing. And I hit it, nothing's happening. It's broken. It's absolutely freaking broken. So I think, okay, maybe they've got touch screens, right? So I'm tapping on the oh, screen yeah, or whatever. It's yeah. like, yeah, nothing's, nothing's happening. It's like, all right, let's leave, right? And so we left. And the producers, what they'll do is they'll wait until you leave frame. They don't follow you most of the time. They'll just leave the camera on because they don't know where to cut it, right? And he had zoomed in accidentally on the freaking green button, right? Well, the thought was, what if we just remove the part where Mark was hitting the green button? Yeah, and then it just we'll make like, it look. Uh, like yeah, we'll make it look like he missed the green button entirely. Therefore, if Mark missed the obvious green button, he's obviously wrong about the whole I Earth thing. I was rewatching it yesterday, and I was watching that part, and I was like, "Why is he hitting the screen like this? Like, this is a little yeah. weird." I'm like, I, "I wonder what's going on." That's crazy. It's, yeah. it's cool that you tell me that because I literally was thinking about that yesterday. Uh, it, watching. Yeah, I mean, and and the thing was, they asked me before they even showed it to me for the first time at the uh, Toronto Film Festival. They um they asked they they said they 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 said is it they had me watch it and they said was it okay that we did that and they I think would have pulled it if I would have asked them because we hadn't and hadn't been sold yet and I said yeah it's fine it's a good gag it's a good I mean it's a good again it's the power of editing like of course I hit the green button there was nothing else to hit except for the green button I was just desperate it was like all right you know. Is there anything up there? And I've, of course, I was touching. Even the monitors weren't HD. It's like, well, I don't know why I was hitting them. It's like, why? Why the hell not? And um, and again, I, I was sat in audiences, and yeah, there were people that were. It's like, oh, Mark missed it. Mark missed it. Yeah, look at Mark. Right. <laughs> yeah, we like Mark's questions. Mark's not that smart. We have some questions for some people that we know that they wanted to ask you. Sure. Uh, first one is: If the Earth is flat, what about other planets? Dun dun dun. All right, if you go to a planetarium uh, and you look up on the ceiling and you see Jupiter, does it look spherical? Yes, it does. Can you land on it? No, you can't. Why not? Because it's up on the ceiling. It's just a light on the, on the ceiling. Uh, no, the, the, not only are the planets not, if not flat, they're not anything. They're just lights in the sky. They look spherical, but they're just images. I mean, you know, no different than on your television. You know, there's all sorts of things happening on your television. Can you crawl inside and yeah. interact with them? No. Why not? Because they're just images. Uh, explain the curve of, it, or of the Earth when in an airplane. Ah, yes. And I should probably send you... Um, if you look up on my channel, there's a wonderful video called So You Think You See the Curve. And it is a... Um, Present little, it's four minutes long. It's Neil deGrasse Tyson. I think he's on the thumbnail. Where they were, um, he was being asked about the feel of the Red Bull jump, for example. Okay. So, the, the short version is: Can you see a curve from uh, from an airplane? No, you can't. It's like, oh, I can. Oh, really? Okay. Because Neil deGrasse Tyson comes on stage and he says that uh, the Red Bull jump, where they showed the severe curve at 130,000 feet. He goes, no, you can't see the curve. Nobody can see the curve from 130,000 feet. You're not high enough. So if you can't see it from 130,000 feet, how can you see it from an airplane? I'm not trying to be mean here. It's not that you see it. It's that you want to see it. You're conditioned to want to see it. It is the straight out of Orwell, five lights, four lights. And that is you repeat something over and over and over and over and over again. 
eventually it'll, it's going to sink in and you're going to start going down that road, which is you're told it's a curve, it's a curve, it's a curve, it's a curve. There's a globe, there's a curve, a globe. And you do that for 12 years, that's just through high school. You're absolutely going to think you see the curve. So is Neil deGrasse Tyson wrong? Because he's the most popular scientist in the world. And he called out the, you know, major corporation on you know, national television. So no, sorry. And again, I could show you. Oh, plus, you know, uh, if you think, uh, I'll, I'll even throw in one more. The, uh, the challenge I put out, everybody, I've put out for the last three, four years now, which is um, if you think you see the curve from an airplane, take a picture and hold it up with a straight edge. There you go. Very nice globe. What is that? Oh, it's a pumpkin. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> um, you hold up a straight, hold up a straight edge to your um, to your laptop or wherever you s did the image. If you still see the curvature, you email it to me. I will quit flatter tomorrow. Why haven't I gotten a picture from anyone in four years? Wait, of a Why? globe. Well, of the curvature from an airplane. You know what I mean? So if you again, people think they see the curve. Fine, take a picture of it. Show it to me. Send it to me. Show yeah. me where the curve is. I think. I think. Um the altitude at which you fly in an airplane is is extremely low compared to to the expanse the like the, the true atmosphere you know what i mean like oh yeah 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 but again people still i mean i have had a thousand people tell me it's like oh i've seen the curves from, from the airplane and yet i can show them the red bull jump and i go so or i can show them a video how many are there out there you know from 120,000 feet absolutely tabletop flat from weather balloon so where is it? It's not there. It's not there. Again, I'm not trying to be mean. It's that you want to see it. Yeah. It's not that you saw it. It's that you want to see it. There's a great line, again, pop culture reference. I know I do it more than that kid in Spider-Man. Um, but he, uh, there was a line from Star Trek Next Gen, which I loved so much, where uh, Picard was being tortured by the Kardashians. It's straight up conditioning torture techniques. And they were basically straight out of Orwell where they were hitting them. It's like, how many lights are up there? He says four, right? And and, uh, and they go, whack! You know, they'd hit him and say, no, there's five lights. You do that enough times, people are going to crack. And at the very end of the show, when he was being rescued, he's going, he's going you know what the scariest thing was? He goes, just before you res rescued me, I saw five lights. And, this is, it's, you know, the mind will do what it can to protect itself. Yeah. Uh, explain how the seasons work in the Flat Earth flat model. Earth model. Dun, dun, dun. Okay, for those of you who are old enough to own vinyl, yeah, uh, you know, rec record players. Uh, hey, look at that vinyl! Yeah, right on. Good, good for you. Uh, it's the sound quality is better. You know, it was meant to. You know, we chopped off most of the frequencies when we went to CDs and then finally MP3s. Uh, so, but the maintenance is a bitch. Um, it is, and plus, you know, your best record players cost ten thousand dollars. You know, with some sort of diamond, you know, thing that you know, it's only found in like two countries in the world or something. Um, so a needle on a record player doesn't stay in the same path. It doesn't do the same circle twice. It, as, it, as it moves, it goes in and it goes out. So when the sun, and it's very, very tiny. Remember, it's not like the, the illustrations. It's like 50 miles wide. It's really like a needle on a record player. So it goes in for some of the seasons and comes out for the other. So what is the force that's like pulling that? Is it just like? What do you mean? What's holding the sun up there? No, yeah, like what? What makes the sun? Like, what is there any uh, control to the sun, or is it just completely? Oh yeah, I, mean, I think it's controlled by whoever's built and controlling the system. Now, okay. what's what they're using? I mean, maybe some sort of unified field generator. I mean, I don't think it's necessarily held on cables. Yeah, well, like we can't know it, but we can understand how it moves. And stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, again, there's some wonderful models out there by some of our guys where they've done time-lapse time, time -lapse stuff with, um, with computer modeling. It's great. Again, and, it, and it's, it seems to speed up and slow down depending on, you know, uh, which groove track it's in. Um, but I also didn't – I don't, also don't – sorry, one more thing about the seasons. I also don't think the sun is exclusively responsible for the seasons. I think the other heating systems all play into it. Uh, the jet stream up above – you know, all the energy transfer from the winds. Uh, the biggest one, of course, would be the underwater conveyor system, which is all the underwater currents all around the ocean. That transfers massive amounts of energy. And then the magma system down below. So between the four, I think you got covered. Yeah. Uh, how does gravity work and how does the moon... Is the moon just... Oh, we kind of talked about the, the planets. 
So the moon. Well, no, there is the moon. Well, no, gravity. I can talk. I can talk about it in relation to the tides because some people will say, "Well, is the moon, you know, connected to the whole well, tide?" I mean, I think it's like gravity, and then like how the moon comes into play. Okay, so gravity is a wonderful thing because it's a push for us. Meaning, uh, science can't tell you what gravity is. It can only tell you what gravity does. I think it's such a great. Thing. Neil deGrasse Tyson, great guy that, that'll, that'll mention that. He says, we can't tell you what it is. We can only tell you the symptoms of it. Meaning you drop something and it falls to the ground, right? And it goes, it, it's something we can, we, can, you know, we can show you all day long, but we can't replicate the process itself. So the best they can do is this magical molecular force that seems to pull things down to the center of this spherical mass. And we say, well, it's a magical molecular force that pulls things straight down. There's not that much really difference uh, for us. Um, in simulations, we call it a physics engine, which I still think we're kind of part of. When it comes to the moon, though, but does the moon affect the gravity? No. Uh, not, not directly, anyway. So the last thing you would want to do if you were building a world like this is hook up a powerful directional gravitational force to an object that was less than 50 miles wide. Talk about the chaos you could cause with that. Um, better to control the tides from down below than uh than do it with the moon the moon is just a marker the moon tells you you know when things are going to happen and you can set your watch by things that happen with the moon but does the moon actually control the tides no because you wouldn't you wouldn't want it to you just do it down below and then if you want to blame the moon hey great go ahead um you know you're not going to be able to 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 decipher that one way or the other in terms of you know it's kind of like um when they when they talk about the sun the sticks and shadows argument it's like, well, the, you know, the shadows are here because the sun is 93 million miles away and it's 400 something thousand miles across or whatever it is. And it's like, yeah, but you know, you can get the same shadows if the sun is really, really small and very, very close, like 3000 miles away and the sun 50 miles wide. I mean, you can do this with a shadow in a dark room you know, with a stick, you just move a, move a, um, a flashlight around it. And it's like, yeah, the flashlight isn't that big and generate the same sort of shadows. But anyway, what else? Uh, the United Nations flag is similar to flat earth maps. Yes. Not just similar. What are your thoughts but on All pretty much identical, um, which is interesting because the United Nations flag, I think, was built in 43, maybe? Can't remember exactly. Someone have looked that up. It was in the 40s, pretty sure. Um, the United Nations, Nations flag is identical to the flat earth map with the exception of one thing that's omitted. Do you know what that is? What's not on the United Nations flag? Dun, dun, dun. The ice, ice wall. There you go. Antarctica. It is not there. It was 46. 46. Good. Um, that would make sense right after the war. So um, the Antarctic, uh, the continent of Antarctica is not on the UN flag. And I thought it's interesting. It's the only continent that's, that's missing from it. And some people said, well, you can't put it on there. It's like, well, you can make different type of flags to include Antarctica on there. Why would you remove it entirely? Except to make it out of sight, out of mind, and instead of putting, you know, Antarctica on there, you have this giant spiky reef. That's a good point because then it's uh, not on the United Nations map, so it's like you know you don't see it. No, it's no one, no one thinks about Antarctica yeah. ever. It's of That's course different from the first blue marble shot of 1972. The blue marble shot killed two birds with one stone. First, it was the it was the um, the very first Earth shot in full disk sunlight, but it only showed one continent. And you'd think if the Americans were taking it, they you know, take you know the northern continent, maybe South America. No, it only showed Antarctica and a little part of Africa. Like, why would you take a picture of Antarctica? If that's the only shot you're going to use of Earth. Oh, I get it. If you want to show Antarctica, yeah, good. Uh, cool. So about your see, like in the beginning of the documentary, we see you point at Seattle, like, and you're like, look, there's Seattle. Like, shouldn't right. we not be able to see that? Yeah. If we can see Seattle, why can't we see cars from where you were standing? Oh, because the island was in the way. I can't believe they used that shot. I see from, in fact, that shot, that particular position is only three miles from here. Um, from that beach, you're looking south, mostly south, towards Seattle, but there's a part of the island that's in the way. Mm -hmm. Part of the thing is, if you could remove that part of island, you would be able to see a lot more that, that was there. Also, there was um, a, a counter argument for that Seattle claim. What about elevation? 
You mean the higher you go, the further you can see? No, like Seattle is an elevated piece of land compared to where uh, you are. Not that elevated. Look, I live here. Because Seattle, <laughs> not, it, I, I looked it up earlier, I think, because I remember somebody talking about it. Seattle's can, elevation is 175. Fine, 175 above. feet. And then... It's not that high, by the way. Yeah, it's not as high as Chicago and you know things like that, but it's more than Portland and San Francisco. Well, actually, Chicago would be lower. It says it. it, says it well. Chicago, Chicago. You gotta remember though. Five ninety-seven Chicago. That's yeah, but that's. Eh, you gotta remember what you're looking at though. Remember that's inland. Five ninety six hundred feet above sea level. So Chicago's six hundred feet above the ocean. When you're looking across Lake Michigan, you're looking literally level from. Because remember, Chicago is right on the water. Uh, you're looking from no elevation. So, so Seattle would be right because Seattle is on the ocean. Seattle, the, the bay that's the Puget Sound is actually part of the Pacific Ocean, give or take. Um, so that would be 100 something feet. But Chicago is any, any inland city you have to throw out because you're looking across a body of water that's parallel to the city itself. Chicago, of course, is the best example we have because you're looking across Lake Michigan, which is 50 miles across. Well, it's 1,700 feet of curvature, give or take. Well, 1,670 or 1,680, doesn't matter. You're looking across that, well, anything less than, we'll just round up, 1,700 feet of curvature should be gone, and yet we can see the entire skyline. It's not a mirage. We've done 12-hour time lapses with it, and, and it survives through um, weather and darkness. It's not a mirage, so what are you looking at? And not only that, but we can see... It's not just Chicago. It's every lighthouse, every boat, every military guy I've talked to. The military guys are probably the best. They're targeting ships at 50 nautical miles away, ship to ship. And it's like, they didn't, it didn't even occur to them. You know, couldn't see the forest for the trees. It's like, wait, how can we actually laze that target from our ship at 50 nautical miles? It should be on the other side of the hill. Mm -hmm. goes, and on top of that, we can see it with infrared at night. He goes, infrared doesn't lie. A mirage, you know, can't give off heat. You know, not not in not in that sort of way. Yeah, that anyway, makes sense. Uh, earlier we talked about how the sun moves almost like a record player. I know yeah. somebody who's a big fan of records is Patricia Steer. Uh, <laughs> she likes yeah. the Smiths very much. Do you like the Smiths? Uh, I like a few of their songs. She's a little older than I am, so when we're talking about early '80s, late '70s, you know, musical taste back then, really, you know, if you missed it even by a few years, you were a completely different, you know, group of records. Um, yeah, what was what was the big one I loved? Uh, How soon is now? Oh, yeah. That was one of my my favorite Smith songs, probably of all time. Um, other than that, I know she was a fiend for them. She had all their albums on the wall and, and yeah, uh, a, ju a jukebox, you know, a full-blown, very expensive jukebox with, with all sorts of Smith stuff. Again, everyone's got their favorite, favorite band. That wasn't mine, but... What was it for you? Oh, man. It depended what age I was. So, because, you know, I was influenced a lot by, by whoever was around me. What was that line from Scott Pilgrim? <laughs> um, I didn't even know there was good music until like four months ago. Yeah type thing where like people people would have to introduce it to me it's like oh yeah by the way listen to this like wow listen to this wow so i was into um all the the rock bands you know growing up initially so like um you know i just just rock it was a guy thing right you know you know guy guys in sports you know they listen to like um old van halen and judas priest and scorpions and and then the the speed metal and the metal stuff started going out but i really got into techno metal or techno stuff after a while so i was a big i was all over the place like i, I owned i think everything depeche mode ever made at some point Crap but then i the then i owned everything praga khan ever ever made mm. and then you know after that i was just all over all over the place it, it, i i liked a lot of electronica just different types of electronica that was my big thing uh what's the record that you could listen to every like like your desert island uh record I don't think I could because it would drive me insane. Um, like anything, the running jokes. Like we we had a road trip. We drove a thousand miles when we only had one cassette. Say a, um, say, a, say a craft comes down from the top of the dome and they pick Mark Sargent up and they say, "All right." Yeah, take you know, one album with you. Bring an album with you. 
Um, boy, I never. No one's ever asked me that question, and I don't know if I could. I could do it justice. I'd. I'd, I'd probably have to puss out and and pick out pick like a best of type thing. You know what? I do. I. I would. I would. I'd say uh, Depeche Mode's greatest hits. At least that would get. What about you, Jesse? The what? Oh, what about you, Jesse? What would you uh, take if they got you? Uh, I'm a big New Order guy. I know you listen to Depeche Mode, so you probably you you got into. Oh yeah, New Order. New Order's yeah, good. I'm a huge New Order guy, so I'd say probably Low Life, I guess. You know, or something Bowie. I don't know. See, I mean, again, you you'd have to. I mean, nowadays you'd have to find a best of though, because yeah. you couldn't just pick one album. I mean, like. Like if you were a Springsteen fan, you'd have to pick that that box set that he did back in frickin' eighties that everybody owned. But I don't know. I, I, music's weird for me. I don't think I could do that. With with food, I could do that, or some movies I could watch over and over. Well, what like would he, that be? What like, would that be? Uh, you had to bring a plate, you know, up to a food. Yeah. Oh, um, uh, Meat Lovers Pizza. What, uh, Meat Lovers Pizza. What a uh, what place? Like a Pizza Hut or. A... Uh, yeah, it really de uh, depends because uh, the quality varies all over the place. Probably some nice local, uh, probably some you know boutique place in Chicago that specializes in pizza. Right. Like, Chicago we're talking... guy over New York. Uh, I don't know because I don't. I haven't. When I've gone to places like that, I haven't like sampled. The only thing I sampled on a regular basis were drinks. <laughs> oh yeah. You know, it's like you know, I, I like I would rate a place on how well they made a Bloody Mary. <laughs> That's really it. like you got any decent Bloody Mary, right? Fine, show me. Uh, but now, you, now you got me thinking about it. It's like pizza, yeah, maybe, maybe pizza. We're helping anyway. you decide what's for dinner tonight. You know. Yeah. Um, anything? Any, anything else? Let's look through here. We have definitely a lot more. They had a lot more questions for you. So. <laughs> uh, do you? I know you may not want to talk about this. Do you have any particular religion that you go with? Oh, sure. I mean, I was raised um, strong, born-again Christian. Mm -hmm. uh, but I fell away from it when I left the island and got into university. I mean, again, I was super naive. Okay. I grew up here. I was really sheltered. No idea about anything. I mean, and it was the 80s. The 80s was like, the t-shirt for the 80s might as well be no clue and no backup plan. <laughs> it's like, we just... Because you know the the I joked with somebody yesterday where you know that Lego Movie song everything is awesome, yeah that was the eighties. Basically everything is awesome. You know we're, that's what we did all the time. Uh, you can sing this. Did you um, experiment with uh, things like like uh, drugs in high school or in college? No, no one would give me drugs. <laughs> like they, they, <laughs> No, they, they deliberately, I don't know what it was about me. Uh, people, I would come, I would ask people for jobs. I was like, wow, oh, what, what are you doing? What are you guys doing? And, I was in, and they'd be like, yeah, we're not giving you any of this. I was like, what? Why not? What's wrong with you? And uh, even, even at university, right? You'd think that at university I could score quite a bit of stuff. And no, my, my friends would, would not do it. And to this day, I have not done most drugs. Um, I've, I've done, when I was living in Canada for a year, I, I did a lot, well, I shouldn't say that. I did enough marijuana with a friend, my girlfriend, because she was a huge marijuana user. And we did just about everything, you, but it just didn't do anything for me. I mean, we went toke for toke, hit for hit on, on just about everything one night. Because she was, I was going, look, it just doesn't have that much of an effect. And she just face planted eventually into the floor. And, um, and I'm like... Yeah, I felt some sort of wave, I guess, but it wasn't really much. So I was like, eh, spending a lot of money for not a lot of results. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll drink from time to time. Um, but yeah, I've never done Coke or heroin or Molly or any, whatever else the kids are doing nowadays. Like never, shit. never, never cooked up a hey, bunch listen, of meth. Scout's honor, man. I'm clean and sober. You know what I mean? I'm oh, there you go. Uh, well, plus I'm also scared of that stuff. Any drug where you can die. That's like every you know, drug, though. You think about it? Well, find me a guy that, that's had enough marijuana that he... No, or or what, have, what, like... what, you know, the drug that I always thought was hilarious was... I always wanted to do shrooms because I had a bunch of friends that did a pizza with shrooms on it. And they just <laughs> laughed for hours and hours and hours. I'm going, this has got to be the greatest drug ever. I go, give me some of that. And that was the beginning of, no, you don't get any. It's like, what? 
he's balling with you. I just seems like a great thing. What was it? Is it Silva? Is that what it's called? Sylvan Silva? Uh, where everything gets super accelerated and you just freeze. <laughs> you don't do anything. Salvia? Salvia? Yeah, Salvia? I think that's what it is. Salvia. That's what it is. That's what it is. Salvia. Where people are like, I'm going to drive on Salvia, right? And, and like they, they take it and, and they just freeze. And they don't do anything. <laughs> they, don't even, they don't even start the car. It's weird. That is weird. Yeah. Um... I did read that you were a digital pinball champion. Is that true? Yeah, yeah. I was a I was a very good real pinball player, but then they stopped making pinball machines around two thousand. the The pinball market just died because you know people had consoles. It's, Why would I play pinball machines? Pinball machines are old. Um, so I played pinball, real pinball, for a while, and then when computer pinball came out, I was really into it. And there was this tournament. Uh, the developer was out of Tokyo and he ran this worldwide tournament and I'll tell you guys because I, I cheated a little bit. So we were the people were playing from all over the world, right? And what you did was you played, this is when modems were pretty new, and you would generate your score with an encryption code and you would fax them oh. <laughs> or email. Or, or email them. No, it wasn't the fax that screwed up. You'd, you'd fax them the sheet, and they would punch in the, the code and make sure it matched up with the number, right? And I'm going, you know, everyone, I'm just like, it's like, how is he generating the encryption code? Because he has to, what, part of it's got to be the score, obviously. It's got to be simple encryption, right? Well, wh where's the variable? He's got to have this random variable, and all of a sudden occurred to me. It's got to be the date time. Because this is before date and time was automatically synced by the internet at all times. This is when you're, you had to set your date and time on your computer. And so he must be assuming the date and time is always correct. So what I did was I took a chance and I generated, I, I did, I, I was, I was getting these scores. They were very, very good, but the tournament lasted an entire year and I figured I'd burn out. I didn't want to turn it into a horse race. So I got this really good score. And what was happening was I was playing against myself. So like you, you play for a couple hours and get like a 900 million points. Right. And then the next game you get 950. Well, you got to throw out that 900 million. And that took a lot of time. I didn't want to waste these scores. They were very, very good in, in the rankings. So I set the clock on my computer ahead. I said I had one month. And I generated the score and turned it in. And it's legit. I go, ah, oh, I see what you're doing there. So what I did was I basically played out the rest of the tournament. I won the tournament six months before it even ended. So I, I played these series of games to where I, I had ever-increasing scores. So if anyone ever beat me, I would wait, and then I would turn in these scores that were I had already played months earlier. And um, I never told the, the publisher because the guy that ran the, the, the producer was really, really a straight arrow. But yeah, that's how... So I, I, did, I did get the scores, but what I, what I did was how I won it was I wanted to make sure that the, the, the guys... There was a guy in France and a guy in... Um, um, Tokyo, I think, that were very, very good. And so I made sure I turned in the best score just before the tournament ended. Sort of like eBay. You know, when you turn in a bid 15 seconds before the whole thing goes down, well, back before they had the, the, the staggered stuff. So I turned in the score, and I won it. And I got hired by the, the company that made the game, and I got to play video games for a living. And that's how I got into it. So there you go. That's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but I didn't cheat. I I just bent the rules a little bit. I just bent the rules. I didn't cheat. A yeah, it was it was a loophole, and I ne and they never found out. Well, I was scared to death after a while because I the the guy that ran the company was really a straight arrow, and I knew full well that if I told him, he'd be like, "Yeah, you're fired." It's like what? <laughs> I get points for originality, like the Kobayashi Maru test or something. <laughs> of flat Earth culture, we didn't get into it too much. Uh, yeah. We saw that there's a flat earth dating site. Is that, eh. have you ever participated in that? No, I didn't. Um, you don't really have to. I mean, those, those sort of things are natural. You know, there's a lot of people when they get into flat earth, they realize they can't date someone or marry someone, or it's tough to date someone with a different paradigm look. If they're like, no, it's always going to be a globe for me, no matter whatever. Um, that's a tough hurdle. And to where I've talked to a whole bunch of people that say, yeah, they won't date anyone outside of the Flat Earth community. However, it doesn't seem to it hurt too much because we have more women in our circles than most other conspiracies. So it's still a, a, a woman's 
uh, thing where, you know, women have the advantage there because they're, I think it's 70, 30 men to women. That's interesting. I, I didn't know that statistic. That's really interesting. Yeah. But well, most conspiracies are like 90, 10, but we're, we're 70, 30, give or take. And actually some of the conferences are more like 60, 40. And we have a lot of, like the conference I just went to a lot of couples, a lot of families. And so I've, I've met a lot of people. So no, I don't do the dating sites. The only the only thing I, I encourage people to do is get the app <laughs> that I didn't make uh, the the flat Earth, Sun Moon and Zodiac Clock app. That's kind of fun because that fires stories off to people. Mark, are you the uh, sex symbol of the flat Earth community? Oh God, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, I just I just ooze sexuality. Sorry. I'm uh, I'm like the I'm like the Russell Brand of flat Earth. No, I am not. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you, he is, he is a freaking player. I don't know if you guys have ever seen some of his stuff, his I've interviews seen. that he's done with people. He is a freaking, he's not, he's not just comedian. He's for whatever reason, he, there's a certain sect of women that he just resonates with. I mean, interviewers, they just get flustered with him. I don't know what it is. I even got interviewed by him once and, uh, he's just a interesting, interesting guy. Um, an amazing mind on top of that. But no, no, not a sex symbol. No, no. I mean, people do. Have I dated quite a few flat earth women since I started this? Yeah. Yeah, I have. Um, but the, you got to remember that when it comes to women, I don't know what I think it's just built. I think we're just engineered this way. Women are drawn to people that are. What's the word I'm looking for here? One, they like tall people, which is super weird. <laughs> if you're tall, <laughs> you are automatically more attractive to women. That is just a genetic fact. Um, I think that's just biological. But the other thing is if you're sorry, even a mind... If, if that, there was an Eddie Murphy... Let me use this real fast. Um, Eddie Murphy did a thing in his comedy routine uh, for Delirious. What? What was I, Ben thumbs I, down for? I was, tell, I was telling Ben that he's short. Oh, uh, well, it is, it's, you know, you know what women really resonate for is Eddie Murphy said this is he goes, all you have to do is sing or, or poetry. Uh, uh, one of the two. No Sorry. No, no. He, he, Eddie Murphy did this whole bit on how all these not attractive singers were just getting tons of women throwing themselves at them. It's like, it's built into women. It's like, all you have to do is sing. The other thing is, is be a minor celebrity that, that carries a huge amount of weight. I'm going, all right. I guess. Um, the, the I am Mark Sargent t-shirt comes in handy. Oh, hey, by the way, that was not my idea. The um, That came from, somebody came up with that on their own because I said in my video, the first rule of Flat Club is you don't talk about Flat Club. Oh, yeah, that's not right. And then somebody made the reach because they had watched Fight Club too many times from, from 1999, where uh, the, the guy that died, who was played by Meatloaf, the, the lead singer of Meatloaf, where he, they said, what was his name? His name is Robert Paulson. And it's like, you know, his name is Robert. When you die, you have a name, right? And then somebody says like, I, you know, we are all Robert Paulson. And then all of a sudden I am Robert Paulson. Well, somebody just, it's like, oh, then I'm Mark Sargent. It's like, oh, cause the whole flat club connection. It's obscure enough that most people thought I was the most egotistical person ever because I was wearing this shirt, the documentary. It's like, no, no, it's from fight club. And the producers got it. Everybody in the media got it. But the general public's like, oh, what an asshole. <laughs> great. What about really, really great. A, uh, what about a flat earth fight club where the stage isn't flat, it's a ball that's constantly rotating <laughs> on a larger stage? That's awesome. So as I you like take that. steps, the stage will move, and then you have to fight at the same time. I like it, except the, the, the flat earth community is, again, pretty, pretty friendly group. They don't fight about it. We've done, I don't know, hundreds of meetups and conferences all over the place. We haven't had a single incident. No violence of any kind anywhere. Oh, yeah, that, for that, anything. That brings me to Matt Boyland. Have, have you talked to, uh, you know, him at all? Matt? Matt. Oh, God. Um, well, yeah, Matt, Matt Boyland is his real name. Uh, Math Powerland is his alias. No, we haven't talked oof, years. Um, mostly because he screwed up his window, so to speak. Meaning when he forgot one of the rules about media, which is media is lazy. And me, Matt was like, oh no, I don't want to talk to media. I don't want to talk to media. Well, the problem was, is I was doing the interviews because he wouldn't do them. You know, when I would call up the media, it's like, Matt doesn't want to talk to you. It's like I was his secretary or something. 
And they say, well, you want to talk about flat earth? It's like, okay, sure. And I would talk about flat earth. And we don't, people don't understand that when media wants to do research on something, they do a really, really quick search. Their producers look up something. They type in flat earth interview. I would pop up. They'd listen to my, you know, some video I did for 10 minutes. It's like, yeah, get him. Yeah. And that was it. And it just started snowballing and snowballing to where all of a sudden when Matt wanted to do interviews, no one wanted to talk to him. It was like, and to where he, he was, he, he would just get more and more angry. Now, turns out he couldn't do a, a, a decent interview to save his life. He couldn't. He was, first off, he was tough to even, even sober. Although he has a kid now, so I think it might be a little better. Um, but the other thing was, he just, he was so, he was so tricky. You know, that, that persona that he had in the documentary, that manic sort of thing that producers love, uh, that's, that's not an act. That's, that's real. I mean, when, when I watched a couple interviews that he tried to do, and he'd be like, wait, did you hear something? Yeah, he has that weird, like, Joe Exotic, like, you yeah. know, type of thing. Yeah. Are you guys recording this? Is there somebody else on this line? You know, he, he talked like, you know, you'd, a character in a movie. And, you know, not, not, not in a good way. And so, no, no, Matt and I haven't. And, and even the producers, the line where the screen goes black in the documentary and they say, you know, the demands that Matt made, right? 30%. That was not a joke. I, every producer, even to this day, that has asked me about Matt, I said, look, you don't want to talk to him, right? You can't. You can't talk to him. There was a producer at a true television out of New York back in 2015. And... Matt and I had just been, you know, we hadn't been talking that long. And she goes, she goes, oh, can I, can I get a hold of him? And I go, I'll give you his phone number, but you're going to regret it. Okay? And she goes, no, it'll be fine. Producers are like, oh, no, I've got this. I'll have, totally got this. She calls me up the next day. <laughs> she goes, why didn't you warn me? <laughs> and I go, and I go, I did warn you. And she goes, she goes, he can't. I go, I go, I know. I go, she goes, oh, no. She goes, we still want to use him in a, in a show but he's not going to be able to work with other people. <laughs> We're going to have to, basically it was going to be like a reality television show with a team of people and then Matt with another team somewhere else. <laughs> and these teams were never going to meet. Matt was just going to be on his own. And even the documentary, I mean, they, they tried to reach out to him multiple times. Producers love him. They were like, oh, it's so interesting to watch. But he's the, you know, you've heard of the quintessential difficult actor to work with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's him. He's the type of guy to be like, he walk outside, it's like, I don't like the sunlight, I'll be back in my trailer, you know, type of thing. What just, would you think about the Math Powerland Mark Sargent boxing match? He'd never do it. No, what if he did, though? What if, what if, what if his ego said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna uh, if, to if, if you want to do it, okay, first off, I wouldn't do it just because it reminds me too much of what Logan Paul's been doing recently. <laughs> Because because Logan Paul, you know, who tried to punk us at the uh, at the um, Denver conference, really? Oh yeah, he showed up. He he bought a whole bunch of tickets and showed up, and no, and he and he he made our promoter swear to secrecy. He wasn't going to tell anybody. And then and we're all guessing, you know, and we sold all these tickets because like oh, special celebrity guest, and people were like throwing out stuff like Will Smith and Brad Pitt and you know all all these people. And then I find out 12 hours before it's Logan Paul, right? And I'm going, and I had just found out that year, you know, I just kind of looked into the Paul brothers. I'm going, oh God, please make it not be Logan Paul. And I said, if it's actually Logan Paul, I'm walking. I'm out of here. I'm, I'm gone. And, uh, and it turns out what he was. And they, not only that, but they were giving him stage time. They give him like a freaking mic and let him walk up on stage. And they're going, no, oh, he'll be totally legit. He's not going to punk us. He's not going to troll us. I go, do you know anything about this kid? That's all he does. He's, he's 24. It's what he does. And so I got on a plane and left and people were mad. And um, uh, so, sorry, boxing match. So one, no, Logan Paul. Never, ever, never do anything that Logan Paul would do. Uh, the other thing is like, look, I'm not young anymore. <laughs> I'm not going into a boxing. Mike Tyson, if he wants to get into a boxing ring, great. He and I are the same age. Um, the no, no, Matt wouldn't do it anyway. I mean, he and I, I think he's t uh, 10 Everybody. years younger than me. He's intimidated. So. What? He's intimidated by the sergeant. No, 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 no. No, I'm well, plus I'm quite a bit bigger than him. But no, I wouldn't want to get in a box. Man. We'd have to do the same thing like Logan. I think they, they wear those padded helmets when he goes in. I don't, they don't go straight up. I don't think I could. No, you know what? I absolutely couldn't do it because um, uh, I've got a huge head. <laughs> 
physically. I'd wear like a size nine hat and uh, it'd be a massive target. He wouldn't be able to miss me. He'd just take a wild roundhouses. He always hits something. Anyway, anything else? Uh, I think I think we're good. I mean, this is a fantastic time. I really love talking to you, man. I think I speak for everybody. Had a great time, you know. Well, good. Yeah. Like, well, yeah, we appreciate you uh, for coming on. Oh, so, no, ha happy to do it. And, and thanks. Who, who what was the name of the guy that missed out? Jason. Jason. Jason, you sucked. Yeah. You blew it. Suck, Jason. Can I ask Wait, you? Where to go, Jason? Wait. Yes. So, um, would you say that the main reason people like dismiss flat Earth like so, they just like push it aside. They won't even think about it being a possibility. Would you say it's because of how outlandish it sounds? How we've never grown up this way thinking about it like that? Yeah, it's it's straight up. It's straight up conditioning. That's all it is. Um, I'll give you a great example of that, which is the American flag. Uh, if you go to right. public school, the American flag sitting in the corner of your classroom, sits there for 12 years, doesn't do anything, right? You don't have to do anything, you don't have to do any special lessons around it. And then at the end of those 12 years, there are people that will join the military partially based on that flag they've been looking at in the corner, right? Mm -hmm. that, that's how strong it is. Well, what usually sits right below that, that flag is the, the globe. And, you know, the flag, it's like, that's where I live. I'm willing to fight for that. And then the globe, that's where I live. I'm willing to fight for that. It is, it is such a conditioning tool that has been put in your mind that I'm not kidding you. Um, when I first clicked on, on my, the, the very first um, Flat Earth video I clicked on, I actually got embarrassed. And I was alone in a house with, a, with the curtains drawn, right? And I've been working on the internet since the internet was new, right? I clicked on a lot of weird internet stuff, never been embarrassed before ever. Now there's some sites I'm like, yeah, I probably shouldn't be there. But I never got embarrassed to be there, especially not by myself. So why was I flush to be there? You know, why was I flush clicking on a flat earth video? And then I caught myself and was like, oh, yeah, the conditioning. And then I started kind of looking into it. So, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's why it's the knee jerk reaction. Why would, in fact, it was something I, I said right out of the gate, which was if you don't laugh at flat earth in the first 20 minutes, there's probably something wrong with you. But everyone will. Everyone should. And and that's how it starts. You you have to laugh at it because I I can't see who wouldn't. I in fact I haven't run into anyone that um that didn't. Everyone everyone goes against it. Anything else? Uh yeah, I think we would like. Hold on one second. Let me pull this. Down. Um, our teacher Ms. Hauser is that what we. Oh, right. You're turning this in for school, what's, aren't what's you? What's her, uh, her and her, uh, is her husband, right? Yeah. What, is, what are their name? What is his name? I think Peter. Peter Hauser? Yeah, Peter Hauser and, uh, and Chelsea Hauser. Can you give them a shout Chelsea out Hauser. and tell them to keep it flat? Oh, sure. To, to Peter and Chelsea, uh, I, if you made it through the entire two hours, hey, congratulations. Yeah. Uh, congratulations to, to making it the, the entire two hours. However... What I, my, my parting remark is this. Take everything I say with a grain of salt. Um, I'm not here to convince you. I'm not here to persuade you. I'm here to just pr present some interesting new ideas or maybe old ideas and plant some seeds. Do your own research. Figure it out for yourself. Because in the end, I'm, you know, you're going to have to tear down the globe or not tear down the globe. Um, however, I do have one recommendation before I go, which is if you like your life the way it is, if you wake up and say everything is awesome and you think you got a good bead on things, don't look into flat earth. And that's not reverse psychology. That's absolutely real because there's a point of no return. If you go into this, eventually there's going to be this line in the sand. And if you cross it, you can't come back from it. And it will change you. So be careful. All right. Well, thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. We appreciate you. you so much. You have yeah, yeah, yeah. Any any chance I can get an audio copy of this? Oh uh, yeah, I yeah, can. Sure. I, I gotta download it and then I'll email it to you. If it'll okay. let me send the file. All right. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. you. Have a great day. Thank you so much. Right. Bye, guys. Have a good one, man. Bye. Take it easy. Appreciate it. Yep.